we be live. Hello. <laughs> I always love when you do that. Lou, yeah, Richard likes it too. Lou. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, today we're doing QA. We have already a ton of questions. So we're going to, so we got questions from Rudrish in the live chat. Uh, before we go to your questions in the live chat, we're going to be answering the patron questions. Just a reminder, if you're a patron on Patreon, that means your questions will definitely get answered as long as they are a question, not like a statement hidden as a question. Um, and <laughs> yeah, so your patron questions will get answered. And you're, we will spend more time, a little bit more time on the Patreon questions. So you touch, um, so that you, you're, as a Patreon, your questions will get prioritized. They get more time, um, and they also definitely will get answered, right? So the, also the benefit from being for being a Patreon is that if you can join us live here to ask your questions live with us, then you could send your questions ahead of time as a Patreon. And then they will definitely get answered that way, even if you're not live here with us. So we'll go through the Patreon questions. Uh, and then we'll go through the live chat questions. So keep sending us your live chat questions because me and Susanna, when we notice them, we're marking them like with a star here on uh, StreamYard to go come back to them once we're ready, once we're done with the picture, right? So that was a, that was a, was that clear? Did I explain? Yes. As well? it, I mean, okay, it was great. to me, but I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So maybe if it, if there was, if there's a better way to explain this, let me know that this was confusing. I mean, I have no idea what you're talking about. Basically, if you're a patron, patron, you get perks, okay? Perks, yes. Become a patron. And another thing, do not become a patron if you're suffering financially. It's not a good idea. Do not support us financially in any way at all, If even if you're struggling a tiny bit. Instead of instead of supporting us financially, if you're struggling, just hit the goddamn like button. It doesn't cost you anything, okay? It doesn't cost. I'm looking at you like, why are you like? What kind of a person do you have to be to just like know that liking the video will help this channel grow? And you're just like, nah, like just like like not just looking at the video. Like we're we are here, so you're watching us. So you value our time, you value the oh time efforts that we're putting into making this video. And you're just like looking at this video, like, I'm just not gonna like it. Like, you're just like, no, I'm not doing it. What, what? Yeah, you, what kind of a person, I, I, I just have to ask myself, what kind of a person do you have to be that you know you could help us with a like simple like, and you just avoid doing it. Like, be ashamed, like you are, you should be Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You always take video. it to the next level, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. All right. So let's let's do the questions. Okay, let's get started with the patron questions. Um, first patron question is from Secular Sekai, who is also uh formerly known as Ego, aka Erica, same person. Anyways, first question is for Armin. Saying, Armin, growing up in Iran, did you learn about the Parsi people, named derived from Farsi of India, who still practice Zoroastrianism after escaping religious persecution in ancient Persia? Are they obscure or well known in modern Iran? All right, first I have to correct for a few things, okay? Parsi doesn't derive from Farsi, it's the other way around. It's Farsi that derives from Parsi because, you know, it's Pars, right? It's the state of Pars that became Fars because that's actually that's where I'm from, right? Uh, from Sh like, well, like half of me is from Shiraz. Um, but because Arabs don't have the sound P, right? Arabs don't have the sound G. Ch, p, j, right? So Iran used to be the land of Pars, Parsi, per, Persian, Persian, Pars, Parsi. These are all the same thing. Persian is the English. Persian is the English way of saying Parsi. Okay. So when the Arabs invaded Iran, and they were like, "What the hell is this sound you weirdos are making? What, who do like p, p? Like what is this? Like you weirdos? We're changing it to Farsi." So you guys are 
Farsi now, right? <laughs> so it's kind of ironic because Farsi is not the Farsi way of saying Farsi, okay? Like the, the most Persian thing, which is Farsi, is not even fully Farsi. It's Arabic. It's an Arabized version of what it was originally supposed to be, which is par Parsi, right? So again, nothing against, you know, I'm just like, by the way, this is not an anti-Arab thing. It's just like, I'm telling you what I'm, what happened. Okay. It's I'm okay with words changing. Okay. I'm not this absolute list of like, Oh, this is not truly Persian. And it's bad. It's not 100% Persian, but that doesn't mean it's bad. Okay. Words can change. Cultures can mix with each other. That's completely fine. Arabic language and everything about it is beautiful and all of that. Right. So I'm not like being like, like, oh my God, this is like, I'm, I'm pure the whole, it's not 100% Persian, Persian. It's, it's fine. I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it being Farsi instead of Farsi, okay? These are, these, I'm like a kind of Persian nationalist or some crap like that, right? Um, so that being said, I I don't know why when, it, when some Zoroastrians, when they went from Iran to India, uh, why we call them Parsis and stuff Parsis. And I'm assuming because they left Iran, maybe, I'm just guessing, before the Arabization of Iran, right? I think that's why they will remain Parsi and they're not Farsi, okay? But it's weird to me. Okay, so addressing the question, I'm growing up in Iran, did you? No, we, I didn't. I had no idea. I learned about these people. Like, it's weird to me that a lot of people are saying, like, I mean, your people are in India and they're called Parsis. I'm like, my people? Like, what are you talking about, Okay. So I don't have any people, okay? My people is Susanna, <laughs> okay? That's that's all. That's my people, and you guys in the live chat, yeah, you guys in the live chat, you're my people. Um, so it, when I learned about it, which was after I already le left Iran, so I didn't know about them existing. I, I'm assuming more people now know about them in Iran than when I was in Iran because of when I was in Iran, social media was not a thing. I mean, it was, but not that big of a deal. Like, there was no Facebook and stuff. And people weren't talking about, like, it wasn't part of the school curriculum. Nobody talked about it. And there wasn't social media. So when I was growing up in Iran, I had no idea that these people exist in, 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 in India. I assume a, sm a, a slightly higher percentage of Iranians might know about them now. But, yeah, I had no clue. Um, so... And also, when I learned about it, it was weird to me that they were called Parsi because people are like, who are Parsi? They're Zoroastrians. I'm like, these are not the same thing. I'm Parsi. I'm not Zoroastrian, okay? Parsi or Farsi refer either represents to, re refers to a language or arguably, I can't arguably because nobody seems to, like everybody claims things about their heritage that is not true, right? Um, arguably an ethnicity, okay? Um, not a religion, okay? Like, I am I am Parsi. I am Farsi. I've never been Zoroastrian. I have nobody in my close lineage that is Zoroastrian, okay? It's, it's, with my, it's my ethnicity and it's my uh, language, as my mother language at the same time. It's not my religion, okay? But in India, they refer to Parsi people as... as as if it's inter interchangeable with Zoroastrian, okay? Zoroastrian is a language. It's, it's Zoroastrian is a, a religion, not a language. So, so not an ethnicity. So that was that's why I was like, why are they calling these people Parsi as if they're referring to their religion? Well, because it was one on one, like at for a very long time, every Parsi person in India, like well, a vast majority of Parsi people in India were Zoroastrians. Because, by the way, for people who don't know, these are people who ran away from the Arab. Uh, colonial uh, colonialization and persecution and they left and they they became you know they became refugees in india like when the arabs invaded iran and they stayed there for like i guess i don't know for the past a couple of uh, you know more than a thousand years um I, i'm assuming that's history right and some people some indians uh, some hindus reach out to me and say like i have to be grateful to hindus because they gave, gave refuge to my people. I'm like, what are you talking about? My people, okay? These are just some certain people that Who? happen to be poor. I don't, know. I don't know. I've never don't been know. there. What are you talking <laughs> about? What, what has this got to do with me? Like, this is like people just like, this is collective way of thinking and tribalization, right? And first of all, you were in the one who saved them. <laughs> like, you're like, I'm not associated with those Parsis. 
and you today are not associated with anybody who might have helped them. Like, what are you taking credit for something that you didn't do? All right. Um, but yeah, but yeah, I mean, I mean, it's good that they were they were given refuge from persecution, so that's nice. But now they're now they're being treated like upper class in India, right? And for a very long time, like they were treated like uh, upper caste. Like you know, they 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 have turned into something similar to their own caste and one of the higher ones for some reason, which is bizarre because for a country that treats others now, uh, every other group as like, oh my god, they're coming and changing our culture and destroying us, and these are others like everything needs to be internal, and if if it's not from the Indian subcontinent, it's like ew, gross, right? Uh, for some reasons, Parsis people never experienced that. Like the British, well, maybe because they ne were never in a position of power, right? Like the Arabs when they came and the British when they came, they were like, we're going to dominate you. And the Parsis when they came to India, they're like, we need help. <laughs> right? I've heard that to, in, today the Parsis in India are very privileged, tight, small community, but they still That's remain very small. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. But for some reason in in India, they treat them as like royalty for some reason. Like they treat them like this really like special kind of people. Like I, I don't know what why. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> I don't know what happened. And also the in the, the entire Indian subcontinent treats like the Persian language as if this is like this is this like unique like source of like sign of privilege and like nobility or something. You know, like some and people like want to claim like Persian as this. It's weird because in Iran, in Iran, people feel like a lot of people feel like an inferiority complex, and they try to compensate for that by saying like we used to we be kings. We I mean we used to be kings or stuff like that. We have the per the glorious Persian Empire. Like we are like this and that. And like right now, it's like there's like it's not, not much there. But they so they have this inferiority complex. But right to their east, we're gonna go to Pakistan or, or India or even Afghanistan. You keep, you see, like actually, they're looking at the Persian bloodline as a way to like claim some form of superiority, which is really bizarre. I don't know how that works. Yep. So there's that. So it's just it's I, like I, all. I mean, it's not like all Indians, obviously. Like there's, of course, tons of people who don't give a crap but of the people who do care it seems as an outside observer to be this like obsession over like who are the real aryans who's the most of the real aryans like yeah. all this stuff and i'm like i've never seen like i feel like every other live stream we do <laughs> you get enough people from the subcontinent in our live chat and it will inevitably there will be a portion of it that dissolves into arguing over who was the real aryans and the aryan yeah. invasion or migration and i'm like who <laughs> i've never seen like it just it's, a, it's continued it's like kind of, it's very it's, it's very kind of weird that, it's kind of weird that a lot of people want to be especially in you know want to be proud of their aryan heritage especially given that what came before it in the indian subcontinent was the was the greatest like when you talk about the indus valley of civilization right um that was like the most advanced civilization, arguably. I mean, ever like that exists on the entire planet. Like the the more people learn about it, like how did these people do this? Like how did they have the Indus Valley civilization? Was like this was like it was this on planet Earth? Like did were aliens involved in any of this? Because this is way too advanced. <laughs> for the planet. Arvin, you can't you can't go no. full history channel on us. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm joking. But like it is, it was so advanced, and that all of that glory was pre the Aryan, um, what you what people claim to be invasion. Now they seem to be what's like migration, not an invasion, right? Well, anyways, and also the Aryans were the people who brought up the caste system into it. The the most disgusting thing about Hinduism and the Vedas were introduced, I mean, the entire videos were introduced by the uh, Aryans, but like, I, I don't know, like, if you want to be proud of, I mean, you shouldn't be proud of uh, your heritage anyway, that's, that's cringe. Um, wait, what, I wanted to say something else. Yeah, but like, we have, like, uh, we ha always have these people uh, from, from some people from India, they're like, Armin, we should be uniting, we both have, like, I I Aryan ancestry. I like, who are you? I don't know. Shut you, up. Like, I don't use the line? Like, no, that no, tells me like, more about you. 
No, uh, first of all, screw you for this. Like, this is like some Yahtzee bullshit. Like, it, hey, actually, now I see on other channels when they want to call the uh, the Yahtzee people, they call them the Nazis. So, we guys, but for people who don't know, uh, we, we say Yahtzee because YouTube is very sensitive about the kind of words we use. So we just say Yahtzee. We call these those people Yahtzees. But it, it, I saw like on another channel, they refer to them as the Nazis. Is Naz you you like our Yahtzees better? Nazis. I've never heard anything sound more disgusting. Like well, that's Nazis. fitting. It should be disgusting. Yeah, I mean that's fitting. Called but, them something. Like, that's yeah. so weird. Nazis. Yahtzee uh, is just easier to say. Yeah, anyways, like, so, I don't, th there's a reason why the Mein Kampf is, like, a bestseller in India, right? So, there's that. Well, I, will, I will never understand the whole Aryan thing. It confuses me. This is, wait, whoops, this is hilarious. Gaijin American saying, as a child of the yellow and flame emperors and the snake goddess Nuwa, <laughs> I literally can't relate. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is the answer. <laughs> okay, that's very cool. This is not a joke. By the way, this is like real references to real stuff people say. Like, it's not like this. This is not anime stuff. This is actual religious stuff. Okay. Anyways, yeah. sounds like yeah. All right, let's can let's. Okay. Move, oh. I'm going to secular Sakai asked a bunch of questions, so I'm gonna switch on and off to different patrons. Mm. Um. Music Guy is asking, this is going to be deferred to Armin, what are your thoughts on the Abon Tribunal that has taken place this November in London and now the second hearing is currently ongoing? Uh, any thoughts on the IRGC's response? So Armin, before you get into this, can you explain to us what Abon is? For people Abon is one of the months in the year, in the Persian calendar. And this is uh, two years ago. In the, uh, it's been two or three years. It's two it was years, November yeah. 2019, right? Two years ago, right? So two years ago in Iran, there was a there was a ma major protest by people uh, where they cut the internet and started shooting people, aiming for their uh, not aiming for their legs. Let me just say that. And many, many, many people died. Okay, so Iran. There was protests in Iran. Um, and like then, 15, you know, 1500 to 3000, right? Uh, 1500 to I think 6000. The numbers are the people we don't know, like these are different estimates, okay? But the fit is so the government just came out and started shooting people in the streets, right? And this did not get the coverage that it deserved, especially I think the coverage. So this was a mass execution of the Iranian government. And this is like two years ago, okay? Anywhere, like other places, if something like this have happened, it would have gotten a lot more, a lot more attention, right? But the government very effectively shut down the internet when they were doing this. And once, and they, they did a very good job at making it difficult for us to, for people to get credible information out of Iran. And then eventually when the news came, we, everybody figured out how bad the situation was when this happened. Um, it was too far away from the event. So it didn't get the back international backlash that it deserved, right? Um, but some people are very, very focused on trying to make sure that the world doesn't forget this. And there is some re re reaction to this because it, it really went ignored relative to what actually happened, right? This was like a bloody, bloody event, right? Um, so there is a tribunal happening, um, and this tribunal has no official power. Like, this is just a people's court, right? Like, there, there's real judges and real lawyers and real investigators involved, but there's no... This is not part of any government. It doesn't there's have no any, enforcement mechanism. There's no enforcement mechanism. And that's why the government, the people in Iran, the IRGC and government in Iran are just laughing at it and dismissing it. They're like, this is just a show. This is not like any serious official thing. But we do have examples in history that we had like people's courts like this, that what it did was it had it actually does serve two, the, the two different purposes. First of all, it brings back attention to it. Uh, secondly, 
it, it gathers all the evidence in a, in a, in a very methodical, is that how the word, right? Way and in, in a very like officially legal way. Um, it does provide, like if there's ever need, it, it makes it official because right now we're just like, there, I, I don't know if people understand, like when you have a court trial on something, and the evidence is gathered it, and by official serious people and collected in a um, legal way, you know, goes through procedures that other people don't usually carry out. Now everything, if you want to refer to things, you don't go to, you, you don't have just blogs and tweets and YouTube videos and activists talking about it. Now you have official legal documents that are collected in a less hyperbolic way, less more scientific way more um and, and more not scientific more in a way that is in line with how lawyers gather evidence rather than bloggers and youtubers and people on uh, you know on twitter like now it's official there for record and you could cite it you're not citing a tweet anymore you're not citing a blog anymore you're not citing just like one reuters article that reuters article like that, that reuters article that came about this was very helpful but still it's not like they're just quoting somebody else. It's not like it doesn't have the full weight. They need primary lawyers. sources. Yeah, but now, now, now it has a stamp of judges and lawyers and official NGOs, like and everything. So if there's ever need to be more work to be done on a feature, it has like a very, very strong foundation now for for people to build upon that. So it does. So it doesn't have any enforcement power. Uh, but it does have that benefit, so it's it's very good. But yeah, obviously, people in Iran are calling it a um, government officials in Iran are calling it a clown show. Uh, you know, just that is that's what would you expect it to do? They say like it has no power, it has no um, standing, it has no uh, official business to even talk. You know, so basically that's. What, but just for the record, the tribunal has invited. Uh, people from Iran's government to come and, and give their side, and obviously they have rejected. So, yeah, but it's been very, very tough. But for a lot of oh, another thing I want to add about the tribunal: a lot of Iranians who are following this court are very, very shocked to see how real courts are. Like this, is actually, a lot. Oh, for I real? Yeah, because they're like, we didn't know how legal stuff. Because they're used to Iranian courts, right? But now, like, they're looking at this act, this court, this uh, Alban tribunal is being done by actual, like, real, the real way that you do law. And people are so impressed by how the due diligence is done and how the, you know, how the methods, the way in which the evidence is weighed. And people are like, this is how a real court is supposed to operate. Oh my God, it's beautiful. But I also like some at the first there were a little bit, some people were a little bit Iranians who wanted this to happen, were a little bit butthurt about the lack of emotion. Um, and it seemed like the, the like the the judges and the questionnaires, they seem to be like question like the, the mothers, like the mothers of the victims are coming out and saying, like, my son died, and this is how they were killed. And it seems to be like from the other side, like this the, this constant demand for evidence. Some some people think like it was kind of cold, uh, but then now they're warming up to the idea like this is this is how a serious court operates. Like this like this this is not like yeah. supposed to be a yeah. So that's so that's been interesting. But it has been very emotional. Like people are coming. Like if you actually follow the tribunal, all the families of the victims and coming out and telling you. Like there was one person who wasn't even part of any of these protests. There was a woman who came to saw a man, boy or man was in shot and it was bleeding out, and she came to intend to her wounds. Not part of any of the protests, and she was shot right there as well, right, um, and killed. Like and the you know the people. Oh, and the so disgusting thing: the way people were responded to by the government after has been very shocking as well, right. Like the, the the people like the, the the families of these victims, they're not supposed to have like their own phones, right? Every time they buy a new phone, the government shows up and gathers their phone. All the phones from all of these events were taken away from the government because they had the videos and recordings of what happened. So 
all of those ones they never they were never given back so there's a lot that's what another reason why they a lot of it didn't get the the attention they deserve because the government stepped in and collect everyone's phones and everything so oh, I, I we don't know what's on those phones by the way like there must be very shocking things right um some people like a lot of people's loved ones were taken away and the government were not releasing their bodies to their family and eventually when they did they were demanding money the government was demanding money for re the release of uh the body and also demanding conditions of silence for you know like for doing this and that um a lot of people you know the the, the government stops people from having um any form of like um, like monitoring and controlling the way the funerals are, they want to make sure the funerals are not turned into a, a major protest um, excuse. But this is like this has become the, the Hussein and Karbala of the anti anti government people, like the Aban. Mm -hmm. Like uh, this is this has become Aban has become. You know how like Shias use Hussein and the martyrdom of Hussein and the people who died in Karbala as like a symbolism for everything they do well, instead of the um, month of muharram it's the month of Aban. Yeah. yes people are saying like iranians are like a lot of anti-government iranians are saying like aban is our muharram like this has become um these are our martyrs these are you know these are our you know this is our uh, this is our rallying card this has become a major like people are like every time you say like mm, bloody aban or remember aban um this is like basically now become the force it, be it become a force of it of its own against the government oh um, and yeah so it's been it's been this and also the 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 victims of the ukrainian flight um these are the two main things so the government has Qasem Soleimani as a martyr to keep bringing back as a way to pro uh, use it as, as a symbolism for everything and the people have the victims of Aban and the victims of the the uh, Ukrainian flight as a mm -hmm. form of symbolism against the government. Yeah. Yeah, I think that just made me realize how much I take for granted, like, the court system that I have here. You know, the fact that I was like, oh, wow, really? They're shocked. And I was like, oh, wait, Susanna, like, listen to yourself. It was very interesting. And I can see why um, people could be kind of offended by having their their really painful experiences questioned. Because they're like, how how dare you doubt what I'm telling you? This is the most traumatic thing that's ever happened to me. But they have to, for the record. Like, that's part of the process. It, would, it wouldn't be the same. It wouldn't be as credible if they're just like, oh, yeah, we take, yeah. Oh, yeah, we don't question you. Like, just whatever you say. So, um, very, very interesting. Very interesting perspective. And it, it's also, I think, very useful because there was a Uyghur tribunal that happened recently. And the results of the Uyghur tribunal were also very helpful because the findings from that tribunal are a more credible format, more rigorously provided that can be taken to other governments than just, oh, we have one reporter here. We have a few investigative journalists here. It's like very collected and thorough and then meets certain standards. So I think it's a very worthwhile um, effort. Yeah, it's you could always use cite them now, you know, and be mm -hmm. taken more seriously because you have something more serious to cite. Yeah. Okay. Um, Secular Sakai is asking, could you please do a review video on traditional Chinese folk religion, not just Taoism and Confucianism, but the whole gambit of supernatural belief? Taoism. Taoism. I think that. Yeah. I know, I just yeah. messed it up. Yeah. It seems Basically. like a very large and influential religion that is often overlooked outside of China, despite illegal industries being centered around it, like international poaching of exotic animals for medicinal ingredients um, on superstitious grounds. It also seems to strongly encourage traditional Chinese medicine as a practice. Wait, it got cut off. Um, as a practice... No, as a preferred pseudoscientific alternative to modern medicine. What are your thoughts? Okay, I don't think that the Chinese medicine part is re re connected to the Taoism and Confucianism. We well, have done videos. There's aspects to it, definitely. Because it all has to do with your chi and different energies and balancing different energies and the effects of things in your environment on your chi. My understanding was that they, they exist... Um, separate from each other and any connections which made between them is just like just because they happen 
side by side, people connect things together no matter what they do, right? Um, I don't think, I mean, I, I, there's nothing, okay, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, Gage and American, maybe you're in live chat, let us, let us know there's nothing, I mean, maybe in Confucianism, but there's nothing specifically in Taoism that c tells you about, I mean, Taoism is responsible for, I guess, like, chi stuff. But I don't think, I think, like, this is just, because, like, okay, for example, in Islamic countries, there's a, lo a lot of, for example, traditional stuff about um, this herbs do this and this do does that. And if you drink this before midnight and do say this, you know, like there's it will do that. You know what I mean? But they're rooted in that geographic area that are and it's not about anything. It has nothing to do with Islam. You know what I mean? I mean, there might be one or two things. There, actually, there are some stuff in as in hadith that promotes some form of like alternative medicine right mumbo jumbo but the vast majority of the alternative medicine that is in the in islamic areas for example um is not rooted in in anything in any like islamic scripture or anything like that right it's just everywhere has that you know what i mean um maybe the connection was made later like for example what eventually became islamic medicine it was a mix was something that just the traditions around that area was just somehow eventually later somehow connected to islam even though the source was not either the hadith or the um quran um Asian american is saying that they've been connected for four thousand years at this point okay so they're not this they don't have the same source but because I guess once they they have been so they li been living they've been connected with each other for, for for such a long time that they will become part of each other. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, so I'm wrong about that again. I guess like sometimes it could be like it's similar to when when people say like in Hinduism like well this was not originally in the Vedas. Well, and we were like yeah, but it's been like I don't know two thousand years or this many thousands of years since this is part of your, the hindu tradition so at one point are you going to now call it hinduism right so i guess yeah that's a fair point so even if it didn't come from it it's it's been so ingrained with each other that it's part of it now so yeah i guess i guess that's a fair point i just don't think that's the first thing you think about when you think about confucianism and Taoism. but yeah um yeah i don't know what do you think um well my understanding at this point in life is that traditional Chinese medicine or TCM is just BS. Um, yes. Well, so is Confucianism and Taoism. Yeah. <laughs> I know, but there's a lot of TCM practices that are repackaged and sold in wellness industries as something legitimate. Um, in fact, like in my area, like you can get insurance to pay for your acupuncture. Um, which is very wild. Uh, but what in, in terms of doing a review video, you know who we should talk to? We should talk to Gaijin American because Gaijin yes. American did that really good episode with you on your personal channel about Japanese mythology and the ways really of the kami. That was so much fun. And that, that was, was so much and fun. I was just so blown away by like how knowledgeable he was. So yeah. I feel like if we had him, we could do a much better video than just on our own um okay so we could t i mean the thing is that i think like if we want to talk about tr uh, traditional chinese medicine and the harms of alternative medicine well that would I have think to be like, separate yeah i think that would have to be separate because trying to talk about that the connection between that and confucianism and Taoism will some you know would be i don't know like okay so here's a more, like if I'm talking about Confucianism right now, especially the more harmful or not just harmful, but the more immediate effect of Confucianism that I think we should be concerned about today is the way that it's being used by the CCP, okay? Uh, as a way to use something 
historical and cultural uh, as cover for exporting CCP propaganda around the world, right? Um, and also as a way to use, because, okay, the communists, you know, the CCP is supposed to be communist and initially with Mao and everybody, they were extremely anti anything traditional, including religion and Confucianism. And, and I say and Confucianism because there's a debate whether or not Confucianism is a religion. I'm not going to get into semantics right now, whatever it is, right? But they were against traditional things, including Confucianism, right? Um, but now they're doing, they're rethinking about that because they've seen the power of religion um, and the fact that it could be, it, the, whoever wields that power will be able to exert a lot of control and influence on people, right? And that's exactly why the CCP is so much against letting Christianity or Islam or Falun Gong or anything else just become this its own powerful force that gets to have an influence on people. They want to make sure if there is Christianity or Islam, it's a CCP approved version of it and that the CPP has a tight control over it. But they're also looking at Confucianism as something that might they might reintroduce to society, but under their control and under their influence as a way to not just provide something to people that um, as a, as a, because they're like, the CCP is like, not doesn't give a crap about communism anymore, right? What they care about is control. And Confucianism would be a very effective way at promoting the Chinese brand, right? And something that is very, very Chinese, right? And making sure that they, if they could release that back on, on, on the world and on their own people, but make sure that it's something that they have control over, that would be something that they'd be very much into, right? So you, you have seen a resurface of government approved versions of Confucianism, right? It, this is something that Mao would be like. What the hell are you guys doing? <laughs> like, this is not the, this is not what we were. This is not what the, this whole uh, project was about. But yeah, that would be something very interesting to look into. Um, but by the way, um, anything else that like Taoism or I don't know, like other religions people refer to that people think like is harm harmless. They are some of the most harmful ones, right? Like people will talk about Taoism because I don't know, like people they watch people do Tai Chi and do some like oh, like they're just talking about like flow of energy and this woo stuff in nature and stuff like that's not, not harmful. Or they refer to Jainism. Um, th this is these are as a, as a harmless religion, as a tolerant religion. These are actually extremely dangerous ideologies, right? They're basically gateway drugs to bullshit, right? They make bullshit seem um acceptable um so because they're harmless right so they because of the the emotional appeal that they have and because they are not like attacking anybody right you think like okay well then it's harmless not not understanding that the most important standard that you have to have uh, is looking for evidence looking for logical arguments and you know not harming anybody is not the only standard you should have and once they once you once you drop that filter and once you drop that guard and accept these other bullshit ideologies and methodologies and then you're opening yourself up to all sorts of other like you're in, you're opening an entire generation of people into the world of uh woo fuckery right so there's that anyways <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, next patron question is from Oxymoron, aka our uh, local Hindu club patron. Um, saying, <laughs> what do you think about the Hindu American Foundation and other Hindu organizations' arguments against why the recogni recognition of caste as a protected category or um, potentially impacts Hindu American community in a negative manner. So he's referring to how the um, California State University system, which is the largest four-year university system in the United States, recently accepted caste as a um, as part of an anti-discrimination policy. 
So just making sure that discrimination discrimin on discrimination on the basis of caste is included within their policies um, as something that they can uh, have a means of addressing. And there's been a lot of um, outrage over this and there's been a lot of celebration about this and the hindu american foundation was one of the groups that spoke out against this policy um so a lot of their arguments that i saw i mean um from the hindu american foundation specifically had to do with they think that this creates an undue burden on south asians in particular and um, I guess in some ways that's correct because they are trying to address a phenomenon that is originating from South Asia. And I'm not saying that South Asia is the only um, community that or area that practices caste because that's just not true. Um, but that was it's people from that community that are experienced that issue. Like it is it's South Asians. Like it wasn't a Nepali student who was one of the activists who pushed for this. Right. Um, and uh, frankly, it's the caste system that most people in the West are most familiar with. Um, so I think it, the, when you're talking about like, oh, how this affects Hindu American community in a negative manner, the actual policy itself, I haven't been able to find the written stated policy and I've been looking for it because I want to find it because it matters what's the actual verbiage of the policy. But what I've seen written about it is that it's just about caste. It doesn't talk about Hindus in particular because they know that it's not exclusive to Hindu communities, right? So one could say, okay, whether or not that's true, most people automatically associate it with the Hindu community. So they will be the ones that be most impacted because they're the ones who are going to have like the target on their back, so to speak, because a, a lot of people mistakenly believe that this is exclusively a Hindu thing. Um, in terms of like just dialing down because oxymoron was messaging us about um, comparing this policy to um, the opposition that ex-Muslims of North America had towards Ilhan Omar's Islamophobia bill. And their opposition to that bill was that Islamophobia is not well-defined and that Islamophobia is often just used as an aspersion to silence dissent and to silence critics, um, as opposed to actually talking about real bigotry that people face. So I kind of understand the comparison. The only thing that i'd be inclined wait to... wait i don't understand i don't understand can you explain what does, what does it get to do with you so do you remember elhan omar's islamophobia yes. bill? yeah 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 but what does this got to do with that so they were comparing xmna opposing the islamophobia bill to the hindu american foundation yeah, opposing the caste discrimination bill yeah because they're saying that they are what the criticism for XMNA was that Islamophobia is not well defined, that part. and then yeah. they're saying that the Hindu American Foundation is, uh, amongst other things, saying that casteism isn't well defined and it needs to be well defined to be able to make sure that it isn't used as a source of um, painting like a just a broad and a broad brush against people, just like casting aspersions too quickly. And so in general, that is one thing that I can very broadly agree on. Like this does need to be very tightly defined because I have friends who like, they are very much against caste. Um, they're against casteism, and they, but at the same time, they're like, well, I don't want some of my family or friends who just happen to have like a higher caste last name to automatically like have um, potentially be more subject these kinds of discrimination policies just because some sources consider them to be upper caste in one place but in reality like their lived experience is not really that because obviously caste is very um uh geographically relative 
So just where you're supposedly high cast one place, that doesn't mean that that's actually like your experience or the reality based on where you live because you live somewhere else and it's not like that. Um, so I, and that's one of the reasons why I was looking for finding CSU's actual policy as it is written and stated, because I do think that this does need to be very tightly defined because I do see how if applied very badly, people from a higher caste background could be subject to more scrutiny than other people. All right. Let me get at this because I have a lot to say about this, okay? First of all, um, yes, I agree casteism needs to be better defined, but it's the fact that the this Hindu, what is a Hindu organization comes and defends it, has a knee-jerk reaction over people trying to fight against anti-caste discrimination, by itself shows to me that they know that Hinduism is the biggest, you know, has the greatest responsibility when it comes to anti-caste discrimination, right? Um, but but this is not so. Here's the thing: a lot of religious communities, religious organizations, right, um, want to defend their religion, but because they know that's a hard sell to us secularists, they pretend like they're defending their people, right? So people are often a lot of Muslims, not all of them, right get more upset over attack on Islam than attack on Muslims, right? But they have to sell the idea that our attacks against Islam, they have to act like this is an attack on people. Um, so for it to be able to for, to oppose it, right? That's why, that's why we have a problem with the term Islamophobia because they come and act like Islamophobia means like we're going out and targeting Muslims and making their lives more difficult. With, you know, and some people are, but you use some people like using the term Islamophobia tries to muddy the, you know, you know, tries to make it more difficult for you to recognize when is that happening and when it's not. So it's very interesting where they, whoever is comparing the opposition, uh, whoever is considering this um, suggestion of anti caste discrimination, they're comparing that to um, people bringing up Islamophobia acquisition because what they're doing is actually closer to that right because what these hindu organizations are trying to do is that they are butthurt because the mention of casteism and fighting that is they know that that condemns hinduism more than anything else i know there are other traditions that have casteism right but they condemns hinduism more than anything else it doesn't condemn hindus it doesn't condemn hindus it condemns hinduism but they have to act like this is an anti Hindu American thing, but who thinks Hindu Americans are most Hindu Americans are doing enforcing caste system in America, right? They're like mo most people don't think like your average Hindu is doing anything like that. Nobody, like, I don't think anybody assumes that you're just pretending like this is going to be the backlash, but but you're actually you're not trying to defend Hindu Americans, you're trying what you're actually trying to do is to defend Hinduism, but you want to have it, you want to sell it as if you're defending uh, Hindus, right? But that's not what you're doing, right? You're, 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 you're defending a tradition, you're defending an ideology, and that's what you're trying to do, right? It's very, but it's also, I'm also thinking this is very helpful that they are fighting back, right? Because of the negative, uh, because it basically shows when you when you go out when you don't even mention like Hinduism and you go like hey we're gonna fight caste the uh, the caste system, and the first, the major challenge to that is the Hindu a Hindu organization, we want that to happen because we want to broadcast to the world like oh look who's here to complain, right? Like you're telling on yourself, right? Your the 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 image, I mean you might argue like unjustifiably but. This is such a bad PR for you because you're like, oh, look who's upset about us being against the caste system. Like, oh, well, 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 <laughs> right? It's very similar to uh, Christians 
complaining about being attacked when you're trying to fight homophobia, right? People are like, we, th- we feel attacked. Like, well, what does that say about you? <laughs> if, we're, if we're anti-homophobia and you feel attacked, what does that say about you, right? So it's a really, uh, it's a, you know, it works in our favor f- for us to be able to, um, you know, embarrass them, right? Um, and also another thing about this whole, like, they're like, oh, this is like, you guys are being hypocrites because you, you guys are against the term Islamophobia. Um, so you should, because it's not very well defined, you should be very against this as well. Our problems with the term Islamophobia goes way more than it's not being like you're like picking on one of the many reasons why people have an issue with it. Like I don't think XMNA is like, oh, this is uh, like coming up with their statement and saying Islamophobia is a problematic term only because it's not well defined, <laughs> right? Islamophobia will still have like that's like a big like there's a huge list of problems that we have with the term Islamophobia. That's like a small part of it. Like if Islamophobia was defined well, that would not make it okay. You're still mixing, making you. You still are mixing people with their ideology. You're, you know, like we like we think we don't think like you should make Islamophobia. Like I mean, I at least I don't think you should make Islamophobia defined better. I think like you should just use terms like anti-Muslim bigotry instead, right? So. You know, so yeah, I, I mean, if your problem is with the casteism um, discrimination thing, anti uh, fighting against casteism is that it's not very well defined, well, okay, that's a fair criticism, but, but we shouldn't get rid of, you can define it better, but you, you should still have those measures to fight it, right? So, but the, t- the problem with Islamophobia is that even if you define it better, it's still a very problematic word to use, it still is a shield to use against all forms of criticism against Islam. And it would be a lot better if you just use that term anti-Muslim bigotry. So, the, and another, you know, another difference is that we agree that anti-Muslim bigotry is a thing and it's a huge problem. Like people, like people think like we have a problem with Islamophobia, and people think like because we're dismissing, we're thinking like Muslims are not victims. Muslims are the victims. Muslims are major victims of bigotry. So, um, so if we want to like protect like lower caste people or outcast people or uh, abolish the caste system as a whole um we're not being hypocrites as in as in we we, it's not like we don't want to do the same thing with muslims like when we have an opposition with the term islamophobia is not because we don't think that we should also fight against anti-muslim bigotry we want that to also be there we think it would be more effective if it was (laughs) if you use a proper label which is anti-muslim bigotry so we're not saying oh don't fight don't don't protect muslims but protect the dalits and protect the, I don't know, the uh, lower caste or whatever, right? Mm, no, protect both of them. So so please understand what the what we have, what the issue with the Islamophobia term is, right? Um, a more accurate example would be if if the Muslim community, uh, if more Muslim, organ- not Muslim community, a Muslim organization in the United States came out and they said, like, we feel attacked because of you having anti-child marriage laws. Right. This is okay. So what you're claiming, you say like, oh my God, this anti-caste discrimination procedures make people at, uh, be anti. Like it will negatively impact the Hindu American community. Think about what that sounds like. Think. I'm just gonna rephrase everything. Okay. And it, think about how, you're actually what you're saying is more anti-Hindu American. Okay. What you're saying is very like these Hindu organizations are actually attacking Hindu Americans. These not the anti-discrimination laws. Because think about how anti-Muslim a Muslim organization would sound like, like how what their view of Muslims would be like if they said these anti-child marriage laws will potentially have a negative impact on Muslim Americans. Just imagine what that sounds like. That's what you sound like when you say that. That's like what Daniel Hikikachu sounds like. <laughs> well, yeah. But like, and, and how, isn't that a bigger attack on the Muslims than the anti, like, isn't that a greater insult on Muslims, American Muslims, than the anti-child uh, and child marriage law itself? So, yeah, that's my response.
Yeah, I think, well, people, in response to what I was saying, people are saying, well, you know, casteism is well-defined, blah, blah, blah. I know in the rest of the world, casteism is well-defined. I'm talking about specifically the verbiage that is used in this policy has to be very well-defined because this is going to be subject to legal scrutiny. You know, I'm not talking, I'm not like... Oh, actually, now that you say that, I don't even know if it's like, we're just assuming we're taking the word of the oxymoron that here as uh that is not very well defined is it maybe maybe actually when if you look i haven't at it, been able to find the verbiage i've been trying to track it down but that was also the accusation of the hindu american mm-hmm. foundation and the 80 plus anonymous csu faculty who signed that okay. scathing letter if so. it's yeah but but I, I excuse me if i'm skeptical if 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 your actual problem with it is that it's not very well defined, then hey, great criticism. Let's take it. Let's define it better. Okay. But somehow I doubt that that's the issue they have with it. Somehow I doubt that if they come up with now a better definition, they're going to be like, oh, okay, now we're okay with this anti-caste discrimination. Good, good job. I just think they're against the whole thing. Okay. And that's just an excuse, right? So just for reference, just for, you know, just for as an example, if you define Islamophobia better, I'm still going to be against it. Okay. I'm, you know, but, and I think like, you know, this, the definition, I am transparent about the fact that the, 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 the lack of clarity over the dis- definition is not my only issue with it. The whole thing is probably a, a mess, right? Are you going to also be transparent about the fact that the, the, the lack of clarity in the definition is not the only issue with it, and you're just against uh, measures of anti-caste discrimination. I mean, I'm not talking about oxymoron, but I'm talking about uh, the Hindu. Yeah, exactly. If the, if that issue was fixed, would you still oppose it? Because yeah. that's my only concern. I still want this on the books. Like, but if it yes, can yes. be fixed, that's what I want. If it should be yeah. fixed, that's what I want. But I st- I would still like it to be there. <laughs> The problem with it is that I think like what they, they might be hesitant about defining it um, more accurately because if you define it more accurately, then either it's going to be as broad as any form of discrimination. But if you want to be more accurate about what you mean by caste, then you might have to refer to the traditions that do have caste system. And then they'd be like, oh, oh now me? you're sick. Now you're signaling us out, right? So how could you be more specific about your definition of anti-caste discrimination without actually having any reference to the traditions that are like, in, that are doing it? Because if you don't, then you're like, hey, this just sounds like discrimination to me. What is this? You know, it's not caste, right? <laughs> Anyways. It's very tough. It's a very, very fine yeah. line you have to walk. This yeah. is why we need good lawyers, guys. Um... So next patron question comes from Gaijin American asking, what are your thoughts on labor unions and union busters? Should corporations have a CEO to worker pay ratios or a more horizontal distribution of power or be forced to do so by governments? For example, German companies have 50% of workers represented on their executive boards. Um, I really have. I don't really have an opinion on this, to be honest. Yeah. Okay. So I think I'm. I think like you need. I need access to a lot more data to be able to have an opinion on this as well, right? Um, but let's just look at it from a. Um, you know, if you want to look at it from a th- theoretical perspective and what seems to have been working historically, if you want to act, look at that. Labor unions and union busters should corporations have a CEO to? Uh, okay, yeah, this is really going to be dependent on r- research. You know, like, like I can't think of any way I could address this from a philo- philosophical perspective without actually being able to. Yeah, I don't think you can, because sometimes there are certain things that you could comment on, even. Um, because you just know from a from a theoretical perspective you know that liberty here works re- really well often or like some government control over here works for, has worked very well often so you could just be like well my guess would be that this would work and this would work but this question is very so specific 
um, that I don't think you should really have an opinion on it unless you have access if you have looked at the research and see what actually works and what actually doesn't work, right? Actually, let's use this as a good teaching opportunity for not having an opinion, right? Um, it's, a, it's, it's okay for people to be able to not say, I don't know, right? Like, yeah, let's use this as an opportunity to say, like, if, you, if you're somebody that hasn't looked into this and doesn't have the research background or haven't looked into the data and what... Not just, okay, it's important not just look at the data because data, you could take data and you could come up with the wrong conclusions from it. Have seen the data, but also have seen expert opinions of the data. That's, you know, and also research, peer reviewed research studies interpreting the data. Okay, that's, that's also very important. Okay. If you have, if you don't have that information, then you having an opinion about this might be very irresponsible. <laughs> All right. So there are, like, I think a lot of times people think like, if you don't know if you don't know something that shows that you're ignorant but there are situations that if you actually act like you know something that is more ignorant than you know saying i don't know something because this is very very technical this does th there's nothing intuitive about the answer uh, of such a question there's like if you don't know the research and you just put two and two in your head together and you're like well i think this would work because of it just makes sense you know, well, that's not how real life works. Many things in life are in complete contradiction to what intuition would suggest to us, right? They're, I mean, if you wanted to go by intuition, then the earth is flat, okay? It's like that's what intu our intuition suggests, right? So imagine us getting something like our intuition getting that so wrong and then apply that to something so data-driven and so numbers-driven and like... A, a, like a question like this, right? So if anybody answers this, okay, even even if somebody wants to answer it with just like guessing, they have to be very responsible by like, this is just a guess. I have no clue. I haven't seen the data. I'm just guessing for the fun of it just to see if I'm right or wrong, just to see how good my intuition is. But nobody should take my answer over this seriously because I have not seen the data in this, right? So it's okay to play around with guesses sometimes, but only if you like make sure that you tell people like this is just a guess. Please don't take me seriously, right? But if anybody, you have to test whoever you're following. If anybody has a specific, um, confident answer to a question like this, without showing you that they have actually looked into the data around this, then that person that's a major red flag for for trusting that person for future information. So just be careful with that. The most responsible thing for, for, for in response to a question like this is that I have no idea, unless you actually have been involved in looking at the data. Well, like what kind of... If I had to guess? No, no, I, guess. I, I, like what kind of data are you looking for? Like what, what outcomes are you looking for that would sway your opinion? Like, what has the highest utility? What has the highest productivity? Like, what is the most efficient? Like, what variables are you? Yeah, I mean, you have to you 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 categorize all the stakeholders, the the number of the people involved, and the their utility relative to everybody else, and you try to come up with the idea. Are you trying to? is your measurement of utility is just to lift up the worst off or just say general aggregate of utility, regardless of who's being affected, you come up with that. And then you look at the studies, you look at the history, you look at different case studies. Um, you, can, you look at uh, expert opinion, multiple expert opinions, because if you're just fishing for expert opinions, usually you could find whatever the hell you like, <laughs> right? So you have to, because there's all enough expert opinions for you to be able to come up with any conclusions that you like, not any, but a lot of them. So you have to like, make sure you dive, you look at a vast number of expert opinions. You, you have to look at how, you know, you, you don't just like listen to experts just uh, talking on YouTube or something like that. You have to see if it's published um, in any major public, you know, the work has been taken, cited by other scholar, uh, people, experts or not. So it's like, it's like, it's not easy, right? You have to like go a uh, deep dive. But if you don't have time for that, oh, actually, you could do Occam's Razor by actually listening to a couple of experts who have done the research. And because you're not looking into the studies yourself, you could just do an Occam's Razor like, well, these, this seems to be what the experts seem to have been, but given that I haven't looked at the research myself, 
I'm going to just say it's very unlikely for nine out of the 10 experts to be wrong about this. I mean, it's still, it's still possible, but unlikely. So, I mean, and if you see, well, it seems like it's the, the pretty divided in the middle. So you could be like, it's inco inconclusive, right? Um, you know, but you could be like, you could be like, based on what I've seen the experts say, it's very likely that this works and this doesn't work. Um, but I'm, you know, things change and I'm willing to change my opinion if new data, better information is presented to me, right? So you, if you if you can't do a deep dive, you could just look at some expert opinion and do an outcomes raiser and do a uh, probability in what you think, right? Cool. Yeah. Um, but can I do a guess? Oh, never mind. I'm not going to guess. Let's move on. We have a lot of patron questions. Um, okay. So Secular Sakai is asking, Susanna, what are your thoughts on this Christian nationalist? Honestly, Secular Sakai, I've been really overwhelmed and I didn't have enough time to look into this. So if you could please ask me this same question next week, I would really appreciate it because then I can give you a better answer than this week, which is like, I don't know about this guy. That's crazy. That's not good. So <laughs> I would love to give our patrons a more thoughtful answer. So if you could please ask me next week, I'd really appreciate it. Sorry, I uh, wasn't ready for that this week. There's a lot going on. Um, final patron question is from D saying, what are your thoughts on gender? Would it surprise you to know that the Talmud contains eight gender designations? Well, yeah, no, because I knew this because I took. I didn't know that. I actually qualified for like a Jewish studies minor at my university, <laughs> and my favorite, my favorite one of the different Talmud gender designations is a gender designation called Tum Tum, and I will always remember that. Or maybe it's pronounced Tum Tum, but I just love that. I love that how it sounds. So I've always remembered that. Um, Wait, so this just throws everything out the window when it comes to like you're destroying tradition and all that. I mean, I thought like any tr traditions that went beyond having the two two genders was like some, you know, east like the Eastern cultures or some tribes or something. I didn't know Ab Abrahamism has also a tradition has in its tradition going beyond two genders. So why, why, where is this argument that this is like you're like this has always been the case? Two genders comes from like even if Abrahamism has a history of not going beyond two genders, it's just Part it's just it pure nonsense. With like um, Victorian sexual norms. Sports this is all just recent history, and people act like it's been like been ingrained in time and space itself. People like <laughs> since big people think like it was like you know a fraction of a second after after the Big Bang, the definitions of gender was ingrained within nature. <laughs> like, it's so true. Before okay, there was so for your thoughts hydrogen, on gender, the, that's like a very broad question. I think before hmm, I was gonna make a joke, but you go right. ahead. But go on. No, I was just gonna say before there was hydrogen, there was gender. But like, anyways. <laughs> okay. Oh so worth it. <laughs> uh, my thoughts on gender are that like most people um, do feel comfortable and align the most with the gender roles that are associated with their sex. Um, but that this isn't, um, it, it shouldn't be like mandated it shouldn't be socially prescribed, but it also shouldn't be expected that people aren't like inclined to just like behave that way. Like have it be okay. Like a lot of people like those things, like not everything needs to be completely deconstructed. Um, but people should have the freedom and uh, not have social pressure to be within like very tightly controlled um, gender roles. But if people do like it, that's okay. If people don't, that's okay. I just think that there should be, be a lot less um i feel like people on every side of the gender debate are very intense about it like can we just like bring the intensity down a little bit okay and just like on. let that's people kind of <laughs> i know that's completely been, unrealistic 
fantastic, but it makes the conversation a lot harder when people are like, I mean, have you been born yesterday? Can we like, of course we can't do that, Susanna. Like, what are you, are you I know. where have you been living? Okay, but here's the, okay, here's, here's, I'm a, I'm a gender abolitionist, right? I just don't think the concept of gender makes any sense, right? Like, what, okay, so there is gender and there is sex. And if you think about what gender is, is basically stereotypes about what your behavior is supposed to be like. And who gives, like, that doesn't make any goddamn sense to me. To, it shouldn't make any sense to anybody, right? Yes, like, we have sex. That's a biological term. And there are certain attitudes and behavior that usually goes with your biological sex that you're born. And sometimes it doesn't, right? Gender is about, and there is a correlation between, you know, there, okay, so there are the, the, the Wokistani Mujahideen, right? They act like, your biology has no impact on your the things that you like and your behavior, uh, and that's ridiculous. But also, people who are um, on the other side, they're also extremists in the thing in the way that they think like just because there's a correlation between uh, our attitudes um, and the things that we like and our behavior um, and our biology, then there's an expectation of what is supposed to be the norm. And, and if, then if you, it isn't if you, followed, Western civilization is going to fall. Yeah, the sky will fall, right? Like <laughs> Jesus um, Christ. Like, okay, just because most people, you know, so what gender, what gender is, is it takes those biological realities, right? And then observes because gender is an identity, it's not just about your biological reality right it's just like okay so because this is the norm of behavior we're going to assign this stereotype to this sex and we're going to expect it as an identity i think i have male right and i think that's dangerous that's almost a, as the same thing as that's almost like a social mandate in my in my you know i'm a, i'm completely okay with completely destroying the concept of nature uh, of gender nature oh freudian slip pause yeah, my anti nature yes. lips the mask slips like no like yeah because i think like people should be more free to just i i mean i think it's there's utility in just giving a more a wider range yeah that's yeah tell, tell people what you think about what i said and i'll be right back oh okay I mean, okay, well, I a gender abolition means a lot of different things to different people. Like when people think like, oh, well, I don't even think we should have gender. We should just like just have this person, you know, and everyone has their own gender. I think that's like completely ridiculous. I'm back. And I'm back. like, where's the utility in that? We need words to quickly communicate ideas across languages. No one, no one's got time for that. <laughs> See, right, okay, so we can't get rid of the gender completely overnight, okay? But we will one day, okay? Because, because there's, it's too ingrained in our society, okay? Um, it is it is a social construct, right? That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Social constructs do exist. Uh, just like a contract exists, banks exist, money exists. These are all social contracts. Some of them are useful. Some of them... <laughs> yeah i am a gender abolitionist right some of them are not so useful and i think the concept of gender is is a societal expectation uh, yeah the con he, he, so gender is a is an identity it's a it's a social construct that is more harm like it's more it cause it has more harm than benefit because it it it's an it gives you an identity and it comes with a set of expectations based on that identity okay I, I think anybody who's an individualist should be against gender identities, right? Because at the end of the day, yeah, this might, I think that I, I am Armin, you're Susanna, okay? You're D, uh, you're Gaijin American, okay? And uh, why are we grouping me with a whole bunch of other people, you know, and giving us an identity definition? That's, that's a form of collectivism in my Because opinion. I have a that's shared a experience of, on the basis of my sex. See, you said sex. Yes, which includes okay. my gender. So you me. didn't. Yeah, yeah, okay, but I'm just saying that 
the, you didn't say gender. So that's that's actually, I think that's very telling, right? I think those shared experiences could be, when, what you could do is just be like, okay, we're having a shared experience, right? You don't have to form a collective around that. You know what I mean? You don't, because, be, okay, exactly. That, that's exactly my point, Susanna, all right? So if you, if you want to pro, find a group of people to relate to, you f look for that shared experience. You don't look for an identity that is associated with someone's sex because now you're creating an expectation of that shared identity, of that shared experience, rather than just looking for that shared experience, right? Because if somebody has that sex but doesn't have that shared experience, if you associate the sex with that shared experience, now you have the expectations of that shared experience for somebody that has that sex. But why would you do that to them? Just go look for the shared experience for somebody to relate to rather than having an expectation of that shared experience. Based it's not rocket sex. science. It's because that's who's most likely to have, most probable most to have had that shared experience. That's an anti it's not a certainty, okay. but it's a likelihood. That's an anti-minority. That's how. That's why we have to come and defend minorities. That's the whole point. We When we say that's more... That's I'm not coming after whole, anyone. I, what are you talking about? <laughs> you're creating an expectation okay so this is this is what it does right this is what like creating gender identity does right you're like so okay the more the woke is they they completely ignore the correlation between sex and these types of shared experiences or behavior or wants and needs and stuff like that right i'm not going that far but the people but just because a majority there's a correlation that reflects a majority of people and you're like, well, this is a reality. Well, I'm, no, I'm not. I'm not denying that that's a reality. I do I understand that there's a correlation here. Okay, but part of our part of activism requires us to defend minorities, right? Like that. That's why, yeah, because the majority have that experience. If, if the hold on, let me finish this part. The whole point of us being involved in this form of activism is because the majority are like that. Because if the majority wasn't li weren't like that, there wouldn't be a minority that would require defending. I know the majority are like that, right? But that's why we need to get involved because the minority are now expect because this is if you turn a you, when you turn a correlation into I'm not saying you by by you I don't mean Susanna but I'm saying society okay when society turns a correlation into an expectation there's there's a there's now a mandate for the minority to conform to be to be accepted to blend in or or be ostracized okay and just the label of just the idea of a gender identity will create that expectation because gender identity is way more than biology you, you have to like people have to accept that sex is biology gender identity is color is connected to biology, but it's much more than biology. Okay, it's not just like these right-leaning people are like, oh, you're denying biology. Gender idea, gender. If if gender identity was just biology, then we wouldn't have different concepts of sex and gender. Okay, gender is much more than that. Okay, and because it's much more than that, what is it? What is it? What's on top of biology that is gender? It's norms. It's ex and what is norms? Norms are expectations. And if there's expectations and, and there's a minority that doesn't fit into that, then the expectation is basically ostracizing the minority. So just when it comes to our behavior, when it comes to our wants and needs, there shouldn't be a mandate. There shouldn't be an expectation. There should be, there, there should be not two, not eight, there's not a thousand, there should be 2000 genders at some point to the point that there is one gender for every goddamn person. That's insane. So to the, you don't we understand have to what have I'm a saying. way to talk about things because there not, are you didn't common let me characteristics you didn't across let me millions of people. You, How do we talk about these things at large? And we're not making expectations just by mm. trying to talk about a largely observable thing in society. Like language okay. has to have a utility. You cut, you cut me exactly at a point where you where it makes it possible for you to completely miss my opportunity. 
Okay, we missed my point that I'm trying to say. Okay, I don't. That is like very irresponsible way of like like you know, I am really trying to make you make a point here, okay? And that was a really bad point to cut me off, okay? I'm sorry. Because my point is is not to have like my point is not to have like a thousand genders. I'm just trying to make it so like we have so like it has to become use a useless thing, right? So I wanted to on purpose for it to become a ridiculous thing, right? So when you say it's ridiculous that was what I was trying to get to when you didn't let me like make the point was I was trying to say like, it needs to be something that uses, loses its utility. Right. People are like, okay, this is ridiculous now. Well, yeah, good. What, how we, how about we just get rid of it. Right. And this is, this is individualism. This is about me being Armin, you being Susanna, everybody being their own individual and we will instead of having it's kind of like it's kind of like i don't know like it's like fashion it's not like you wear this you wear this and these are the two options how about we have a mil gazillion options how about everybody's identity and behavior and expectations are set to that individual and you're like people are like we need to communicate well what do you need to communicate do you need to communicate people's sexes because we're not, I'm not a sex, abol abolish, like, I'm not abolishing sex. What exactly do you need to communicate? What it is that, what, it, like, what it is, what is it that be, is being communicated? Because if you're communicating sex, we already have words for that. And we already have ways to refer to that. But if you are referring to gender and you like, I need to be able to talk, refer to that, then the thing that is being referred to is expectations. Like, um, excuse me, I'm sorry. If you are saying that I need to be able to refer to my, to the societal expectations that I have of what you're supposed to be like, then no, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, you want to communicate that? Like, well, I want to, it's not, it's not just the communication that is being removed. It's the whole concept being removed. So what you need to communicate to a concept that is completely being removed is like, as if somebody saying like, oh, I have a, I have a word for, you know, Jews that, you know, betray their, like their own kind. Like, okay, that's a harmful term to use. Like, what we need to communicate? Like, well, I'm not just removing your form. I'm not just removing your word. Like you're, people act like there's a thing that is supposed to exist. And what we were trying to do is re remove the word that is referring to that concept. No, I'm removing the entire concept, just like abolishing caste. They're like, okay, if we want to abolish caste, somebody like, well, we need words to refer to things. I'm not just, I'm not saying keep caste and remove the words that refer to the caste. And now we're like, oh my God, we can't communicate. No, we're abolishing the concept itself. So there's no word to refer to something that doesn't even exist. Anyways, does that make sense? I know we disagree, but does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, um, I think... I agree with you in that I would like it to be useless. I would like it to not have an impact on people's life. I would like it to be use useless in the sense that it does not impact people's lives. I still think even at that point, it would be useful to have common language to talk about these things. However, I don't think that we will likely reach a place where it is useless because, like I said, sex and gender are not the same thing, but they are related. And I experience a vulnerability to violence on the basis of my sex, which informs, for me, my gender, right? And I'm not talking about, oh, I, I'm oppressed, blah, blah, blah. I'm just being reality-based. I'm a young woman. I am more vulnerable to violence than other people. Right. And so I, I think like, I don't think that's going to change about the world. Um, I, I mean, I have so many different feelings about this. I think I view this a little bit differently because when you were, when I was talking about like, we're just talking about improbabilities, right? I'm not, because I'm talking about on average and making, you can make generalizations when it is on average, right? 
because that's by definition what it is. I am not making a mandate or an expectation. I think this is partially important to me because I have a health condition that is exclusive to my sex. And who do I go look for in terms of resources and advice towards these things? I'm going to be looking for people that express a female gender. Now, this isn't going to be exclusively who experiences this problem. That's definitely not true. But it's just like, who, who's going to likely have the uh, more resources put out about this thing? Who's? I'm not going to be, it's very unlikely for me to be finding someone who is a trans man, like, talking about what I deal with or you like we just we can't no. be in a perfect world we would be like that non-diffuse but our, our brains are organized to search for and attain information on the basis of judgments in what we observe and okay, it's uh, not me being against protecting the minority just by... I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. When I was using the words you, I was talking about society and expectations that is comes uh, with definitions of word. Um, just just before we go to the next question, none, none of that communication that you were hoping for and none of that will go away because we still have the concept of biology and sex and stuff. I don't think any of that will be removed from your toolkit of being able to find people and community and shared experiences with the language that we already have around sex, um, I think all of that is still accessible, okay? And we also have other uh, people that have similar problems that is not cor correlated with their sex, um, and, but is connected to their shared experiences. Um, that are still able to form community. For example, if you people who are suffering from AIDS, um, AIDS is not connected to anyone's sex, but people who are suffering from AIDS, they are able to get together and provide community and share, uh, provide uh, identity around a shared experience um, without needing to create like a, a, a societal term, a, 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 a norm an identity that goes beyond that shared experience that they have around that, that problem, right? So for example, if you're having a problem that is somehow tied to your biology, um, you could provide, create identities and communities around that specific shared experience without defining a new term that includes other people that, that, are, that don't have that shared experience and in, while having the negative effect of creating expectations from them, right? So you that is done. That is possible. You don't. Yeah, need like I'm an inclusive person. No, I don't think. I don't know if I'm explaining this very well, right? Like I just think like removing the gender language from the equation does not stop anybody from creating either identity around the shared experiences that you mentioned, um, whether it's like any form of disease or any form of um, shared experience or anything like that. People create identities around communities and shared experiences like that. And it's actually very much more effective when it's very specific rather than something broader that includes other people, right? So I don't think any of that would be lost. I think... But anyways... I'm having, to be honest, like a, a personal reaction to this because when I thought the way that you do, I that was the period of my life where I hated myself for being a woman. I hated it. I despised myself. I carried shame. It took me a long time long long time to be okay with being a woman and um yep you've been yeah. dealing with okay so i think like this is the problem i think a lot of extremists that made you suffer from the experience like i i'm not suggesting the things that they are and i think like the problem with a lot of wokistani far right leftists is that they they have made this conversation so toxic that if I'm like any form of suggestion of what, like I am not doing anything like that. Like I'm not like, I'm just talking about the utility of norm uh, setting expectations of society. Okay. There's not, there's nothing even remotely close to what they're doing, but they have, they have made this entire conversation. It's so toxic that it, it, people will have associate what I'm saying to what they're, what they are. And that's why 
it's hard it's hard to even be listened to because you just be you'll just be grouped with them right and that's why they have been so harmful um, in their effect on these kind of conversations this is a very important conversation by the way i don't think this I, I, I think gender will be abolished at some point anyway i mean what's gender when we're all in the metaverse right but anyway so let's go <laughs> <Shut the fuck laughs> <laughs> Tony is asking me if point. I would have transitioned. I almost transitioned, not as a teenager, yeah. but as a young adult. See, um, yeah. Then, yeah. But Anyways. I don't like to talk about it because people will make it seem like I hate trans people when I have so many people in my life who I've personally witnessed go through really, really hard things because of their experience as trans people. And it's a community I care about a lot. So... When I, I talk about what I go yeah. through, like people make it seem like it's going to be used to hurt other people, and I don't like it. I'm sorry. So I'm sorry if I trigger, like, but but when I use the trigger here, I'm not using the word <laughs> in the insulting way. I'm actually using it in the proper way. Like, I'm sorry if I um, brought some bad experiences. Like, I, I completely under, like I don't actually. Um, but I get it if if this is like this brings back memories that you don't like. From. For people who don't know, um, Susanna used to be associated with um, Antifa type people, right? And they made her hate herself. <laughs> so this is not. So she does have a negative reaction to any any to some some of the talk that might seem like is is suggesting what they're suggesting. She does have some negative reaction to it. And the thing is, I understand very well. I literally studied critical gender studies in university i was awarded honors for my writings in the subject right like i won like yeah. out of my entire senior class like they gave me they paid me for it so like i ex yeah. i know the arguments extremely well right and personally it really damaged me oh bahara sultan is here he's saying i'm with you susie mm. um all right somebody was complaining that this is a boring topic and constantly demanding us to switch but let me i'm gonna let you know that you're not the king of our live chat cc menace like here he or she uh, enjoyed the conversation so some people like this conversation okay so we're now gonna move on to the next question um okay so if you would like to have us rant for hours about your patron questions <laughs> and get that special yeah. treatment you should become a patreon uh link in the description because uh, if you're like you guys didn't pay attention to me you didn't get to my question well if you are a patron then we make sure to get to your pet question that's non-negotiable oh my god secular sakai mm -hmm. is saying i just donated a hundred dollars to the atheist republic legal defense fund and invite others to give what they can if they're able to at this time oh my god that's so nice <laughs> That is, oh, wow thank you guys guys link in the description for for that defense fund thank you so much secular sake that's very sweet oh my, my god gosh. that means we're getting like a lot closer to our latest goal amazing nice thank you thank you um my last thought on the whole gender thing is i hope like the my take i tried to just like be sympathetic towards like hey don't have super strict gender roles. Western civilization isn't going to collapse. But yeah. also, like, we don't have to demonize people because they want to just be a housewife. <laughs> like, can can we just, like, leave it at that? It's just, really, just, like, I don't have, I feel like that's not a crazy top, like, opinion to have. Right. That's the easy part. When Once you get into the details, it gets more tricky. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Um... So first patron question is from Rudresh because Rudresh came early. Page, he comes, not patron, live chat question. Excuse me, live chat question. He comes early. He leaves them locked and loaded. Um, yeah. So Rudresh is asking, did Ali Dawa make a fool of himself in front of apostate prophet, referring to the no. recent debate that they have on their channel. No, he's saying, did you see Ali Dabo make a fool of him? He, he's uh, not asking. I, he's, he, Rudrish is I very clear read. that he did. Rudrish is very clear that he did make a fool of himself. That's not a question for him. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, no, 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 no. That's not my, no. Did you, my question is that you, did you witness it? <laughs> because <laughs> I actually, <laughs> 
started watching the debate before we went live. There was so not I a debate. Seen the whole thing. It's it not was hilarious. It wasn't a debate. It was not a debate. It was just like an insult fest. <laughs> just back I know it immediately started with like. <laughs> I mean, not, not back and forth. Like, technically, that's... technically, it was an insult fest from. Ali Dawa to Apostle Prophet. Apostle Prophet was just experiencing the whole thing. I mean, I felt really bad for Apostle Prophet because, like, he's being like, what he's like, why does he have to deal with this crap? <laughs> it was yeah. so, okay. Like, so I I didn't see the whole thing. I saw in terms of their actual conversation with each other. I saw maybe like less than thirty minutes. At least in the part that I saw, it seemed like AP was just like living it up, laughing. I was like, this almost seems like like a like a tag team comedy duel. Like I'm loving this, but maybe it got more intense later. I don't know. <laughs> guys, I don't know if you guys. So for let, let me tell people who don't know what this is. This was a debate between Ali Dawa, who's a Muslim, and a Prophet Prophet, who was a ex, is, who is an ex Muslim, right? Um, so for people who don't know what's happening, and it was like it was a it was a train wreck, right? Um, because Ali, Ali Davo is like, oh my God, what the hell is wrong with this person? But, Me. um, but so we're not going to go over the details of that debate, but what I can tell you about the backlash from that is that it has created a major divide about uh, in the online Muslim community. Okay. Oh, um, a lot of Muslims think that Ali Davo is worse for Islam than Apostle Prophet. <laughs> So, we're winning, so boys. We've been telling you this I mean, for years. <laughs> I mean, they're technically correct. Um, there right now there is a major debate over if this is the right tactic. Who like why is Ali Dawa like maybe Ali Dawa should just step don't should he shouldn't be debating ex-Muslims? This is embarrassing. Uh they they feel like there are a lot of Muslims that are feeling more insulted by the way Ali Dawa is defending Islam than the way opposite prophet attacks Islam. <laughs> so, and now there's a, like a Muslim and Muslim um, civil war happening online over this, right? Um, so that's fun to follow and watch. Like, it's very interesting. But, but again, they can't help themselves. And this is why we keep thinking that our greatest assets when it comes to tackling Islam are these un Muslim person uh, like, personalities right like daniel Heyreju is an asset in our in our fight um ali daba uh muhammad hijab these are people that are technically fighting on our team um the more they grow the better it is for us to demonstrate what I, islam i mean they, they are very very famous they're very they have a lot of followers and they cannot it's, they cannot ignore the fact that is the parts of Islam that is the most problematic, like because their own, like nobody will accept them, right? So, because, like, if you have like a whole bunch of small YouTubers, Muslims, if each one of, like, each, if each one of them comes and says, like, oh, yeah, wife beating is okay, then people are like, oh, that's just a one time YouTuber, like, small YouTuber, who's, who's that guy, right? But when you have, when we when you have these online personalities growing and they cannot deny the wife beating parts of Islam, the slavery parts of Islam, uh, the killing of apostates parts of parts of Islam, right? Um, and they have, you know, then it makes it. And they're out there, and now they're debating other people, and other people, and the the non-Muslim world who wants to see what Islam represents will have to come watch the debate between these online personalities and others. Then we don't like our job. It's become so much easier. We just have to like, don't listen to us about what Islam is about. Like, look at them, right? Take, but Ali Dawa doesn't even do that because Ali Dawa is not really good. You know, Muhammad Hijab and people like Muhammad Hijab and Daniel Hayraju, they know Islam, okay? They disagree with each other very much, but they know it. Like, Ali Dawa doesn't know stuff from them as much as they do, right? Uh, he's like way below them. And like at least with Muhammad Hijab and Daniel Hayraju, even though they have completely different methodology and different beliefs, their online community, they're like, they're fascinated by them because they're like, how do you know all these hadiths? Look at the vocabulary that you use. You sound so sophisticated and to, like, you know, these verses in the Quran by heart. And they're like, they are, they love them, that they love them, right? So their community grows. But Ali Dawa, Ali Dawa is like, he's just like, 
I don't want to be insulting. I was going to say he's a cl- he's just like a clown that people want to see, just like make say weird stuff and just like that's I don't know. He's just like he's just an online person. The people come to Ali Dalva because of this personality, okay? Whether they hate it or they love it, that's what they're there for, okay? So when you put him in a debate, it becomes very embarrassing, and that's why a lot of Muslims are like, "Oh my God, this was not good. This is not how we want. To, we want like Muhammad Hijab and Daniel Hayraju or maybe people like that to defend Islam, not this guy, okay? So they they feel attacked, right? So right now there's like a damage control going on. You know, to your point, Mustafa is saying, I think Ali Dawa contributed to my turn into atheism when I was a Muslim. There you go. That's what I'm so, talking about. <laughs> I mean, this is not he's on our side. Anecdotal, but yes, he's on our side. Yeah. But let's actually... confirmed. Oh. <laughs> no, Farid is pretty clever too. Are we talking about Farid Leaks? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it makes me laugh so hard that you think his name is Farid Leaks at this point. No, he's no, his name. Okay, he is Farid Leaks. Um, but no, but. <laughs> What's his actual name, though? I don't know. <laughs> I think it's Farid, okay, Farid Speaks. Some... Farid Speaks, okay. Um, Farid uh, Speaks. He's very knowledgeable about hadith and history of Islam. All Most of them are. Like, okay, Muhammad Hijab and Daniel Hanraju and Farid and this other guy who's, like, calling them out. What's his name? Sajid. Sajid, Sajid something. Sajid. They are... They are. They have comp- different philosophies and different methods, but all these four guys, they know their stuff. Okay, they know their stuff. Ali doesn't. Ali doesn't know his stuff. Ali Dawa doesn't know his stuff compared compared to them. Yeah. Farid I think we both got it wrong. It's for response. <laughs> <laughs> guys, yeah. no, it's just Farid leaks. Come on. <laughs> oh yeah, Sa- Saeed Lip- Lipman. Yeah, he's. He is the okay, Sajid. Yeah, not say Sajid Libman. Okay, okay. The closest person, the closest YouTuber to Islam used to be Daniel Hayreju, but it's not okay. It's Sajid. Sajid, true Islam, Sajid Libman. Nothing gets closer to true Islam than Sajid Libman. Okay, because every single other person is doing bid'ah. Okay, every single other person, including Daniel Hayreju. They're like dabbling into Western and Greek philosophy and modern science and all of that. The person that is the most grounded in Islam and refuses to give an inch to even using other people's methodology is Sajid. Okay. Wait, so, I have a question. Hmm. So do you think, because you, you're saying it used to be Daniel, now it's Sajid. Is Daniel now you know, pushed to the side because he's gotten so much no, into the red pill no, stuff. No, because no, because Daniel is so Daniel's vocabulary is like very impressive, right? Um, he is a Harvard graduate. Um and and the thing is that he knows the enemy, right? So he uses the enemy's um, arguments and research methods and because his his fight Daniel's fight is more anti-modernity than pro-Islam, right? He gets dragged into talking about Islam, but he knows that that's a losing... Like, every time he gets dragged into defending Islam, that's not where he wants to be because he knows his audience will be shocked by everything he's saying, right? So he doesn't want to play defense. He wants to play offense. He wants to play an attack on modernity rather than defending Islam, okay? He might not pretend to say that, but that's what he's doing, right? Um, but to fight against modernity, he ha- he has to use the tools of the enemy, which is like I don't know, like cited studies, um, you know, talking about, and also using philosophical terms and methodology that was firstly like this is the stuff that uh, the Salafis were against. They're like, what are you guys doing? Like this is like you guys like they were against Ibn Sina and everybody and the Asheris and everybody and the Mutazilites because like. This is not the Quran. This is not the Hadith. You guys are using Greek myth, Greek philosophy in your argument. Like, why are you even proving God? Like, who needs to prove God? Like, the Quran said there is a God. Like, we we believe in God because of revelation, not because of your goddamn philosophical argumentation for why we need like a prime mover and crap like that. Get this Greek shit out of here. 
right? Like this is they are saying this is Greek stuff that these Mutazilites and everyone else after them they just introduced to Islam, and this is not original Islam. Tell me when Muhammad come up and talk. When when did Muhammad talk about the proof of God through like you know Aristotelian models and like Plato and all of a sudden these Enlightenment thinkers like they like we had none of that shit, right? So why are we doing that? Why are we playing in their field, right? But this is what Daniel does because Daniel thinks like, well, nobody's going to take me seriously if I don't use their methodology against them, right? But Sajid is like, I'm not even, I'm not, I don't even want to step in that game. We believe in God because of revelation, because of God, because the Quran told us so. We don't, he, we don't need logic. That's what they actually, that's what he is claiming, right? We just accept the Quran as it is. We accept the Hadith and Sunnah as it is. No Christian ask. You don't need a reasoning, right? So that's that's truly the most truly that's the most Salafi thing to do, you know. That's the most like original Islamic way. I mean, I don't know if I should say original Islam because the history of Islam was so much um got so much mixed with using other forms that now we could like, well, is it Islam now or is it not Islam? I guess we could say Sajid is like OG Islam, and Daniel Hayraju is kind of like. I mean, even Ibn Taymiyyah kind of got involved in having philosophical arguments, right? So, like, maybe, like, Sajid is so close to the Muhammad and the first the the first people after Muhammad, okay? But I don't want to say, like, Daniel Hayraju is not being, it's not according to the tradition. I guess, like, many, many years after, Daniel is, like, more closer to that. But if you want to, like, OG, like, pure... Great A Islam, go to Sajid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that that real yeah. fresh creme. Um so and he's been Sajid Sajid has been trained in okay, think about this, okay? Think about who as a as a Muslim, okay, who wants to be like looking at this who to follow, okay? Do you want to get do you want to follow Daniel Hayraju who's been trained in Harvard? Western academia, right? <laughs> or do you want to follow Sajid, who's been trained in Medina? Mm. Sajid has been trained. He's like, he went I didn't know that. to Medina. No, he got his Islamic degree inside the Medina, inside Medina to Nabi. Like, that's like, you can't get more original than that, right? You can't get closer to the truth than that. He's been involved with, with the heart of Islam. He's been inside the he and he's he's come back from there with all the or with the most purest grade A Islam that you could find. Like he's sharing that. Like you don't like if you want to get what the Sajid has, you have to go all the way to Medina and talk to Islamic scholars over there. But now, Sajid is now bringing that, that to you on YouTube and making that available to all of you. Like you can't get closer to the truth than that. Anyways. <laughs> such truth, such wow. <laughs> Mashallah, I want to follow Sajid. <laughs> um, okay, next question is um, What are your views on the Karnataka hijab controversy? We are going to be talking about this on the news this week, so tune in in two days where we will be talking about this big row in more depth. Um, Yes, because it has blown up in India. Um, so next question is from Nir Jalal. Do you think Jordan Peterson's interview with Muhammad Hijab indicates infiltration of Islamists into the intellectual dark web who otherwise are infamous for being an Islamophobic group? What will be the outcome? Well, okay, I don't know if it's an info when i think infiltration i think of it like as amongst their own ranks like i don't think of muhammad hijab as suddenly becoming kind of an idw like type figure i think they just had a discussion with each other as a guest like in good faith basically for to talk about the opposing ideas i don't think this is I mean, it might have, like, introduced Islam to, like, Jordan Peterson's, you know, like, conservative-leading audience because Muhammad Hijab does accurately say, like, like Muslims do, like, a lot of what Peter, some of what Peterson has to say because he is more conservative-leading. He, he, he does have 
very specific conservative values that align with some values taught in Islam. Maybe not for the same reasons, but there is some similarities or alignments there. So, I mean, you know, there's the off chance that there was someone who's like, you know, I'm going to go look into this Islam thing after this. You know, like the meme, like Islam is right about women, like that kind of situation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, this is- uh, this is just okay so this is not an idw thing okay because the idw thing broke apart uh it's been a while because um and there's nothing there's nothing that you that was <sighs> united them together as a group other than the than being against cancel culture like they have no there's nothing else there right they are completely all over the place um they have disagreements over everything. You have left leaning, right leaning, um, and that's why it broke apart. Because like being against cancel culture is not enough for you to be see eye to eye with other group of people, right? Um, th- and that's why you know. And most of the IDW is, is has been very cringe, right? So I mean, going against like you're spreading some real conspiracy. It really nothing. fell apart in 2020. 2020 was I mean, a rough year. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, if you, if you, if I mean, how much praise do you want to get for just being correct on the on the being anti cancel culture, you know, thing? You're like, okay, yeah, that's bad, okay. But on anything, everything else, most of them were not that good. Um, and also, like, so I don't, I don't think like saying hijab is getting closer to IDW is fair because I don't think like the entire group can be group, you know, this like it's not like I think like. Jordan's right more of a I don't know conservative ideas. That's what I think like is attractive to people. Like this is just right leaning people getting along, right? Like I, there was at some point I, you always see that throughout history, left leaning people getting close to Islamic, you know, groups at first, and then every time like oh my god, we're so what the hell are we doing together? We hate we should, we're supposed to hate like it keeps backfiring on leftist group every goddamn time, but they keep repeating it over and over again. And like, for the past, I don't know, uh 150 years, leftists keep exp- you're like, Hey, we're like we we hate these right leaning people, right? And like you're like, Yeah, so they joined, and then eventually the leftists are like, Oh my god, what is this? Like, we don't like this at all. Every time it breaks apart, and like you guys think like what happened in the United States or in the UK when leftists are realizing that oh my god, this is not this is not a new thing. This has happened throughout history, and it, it would be a fight between leftists, like a, a first marriage between leftists and Islamists, and then a breaking apart. And the breaking apart, you at least in the Middle East, when that ever happens, it's a lot more bloody, <laughs> right? It's not like okay, we don't like you anymore. It's not like that. It's more like mass executions or like terror threats and shit, stuff like that. That's how. That's not how Islamists and leftists get divorces. Uh, often get div- like have been getting divorces before, right? But but it's also it's not just a divorce between leftists and Islamists. It's also a realization of Islamists are like they're looking at right-wing people are like, hey, hello there. <laughs> like you know, like we're not. That- yeah, wait a second. We actually have more wait in common. We are. Yeah, we we're like. You you hate gays. We hate gays. We hate trans people. Like the main problem values. is you seem to keep bombing us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, like that, we have a lot in common. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like women, woman roles, traditional woman roles. Like I don't know, like fa- traditional family things. And like, why are we fighting each other, right? So, and this is like, this is also why you see. Um, this is now also getting in meme culture and everything everywhere else over the internet. You always see this is the whole idea, like Susanna said, the idea of right-leaning people saying Islam is right about women, right? They, I mean, they 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 see eye to eye with each other, but also the this is why red pilling is becoming now very very popular in Muslim communities, right? And a lot of Muslim communities that live in Western countries they feel overwhelmed. By this attack of new norms and new gender roles and new understanding of new liberal ways of looking at what a family is supposed to uh, is supposed to or not supposed to be like, right? And they're like, oh my, they they feel attacked over the tradition and they feel like 
Islam doesn't get, really give them the equipment to fight back against this, right? They feel like they're being overtaken, their traditions, their values are being overtaken. And they're like, there's nothing, there's not much in the Quran or Hadith that equips them with like fighting back. But right leaning people, because right leaning people have been fighting against these um, attacks on, gen, on these new norms. Um, and this is their, this is their home, right? This is like the Western countries. So they are, they have been well more equipped with fighting these new roles. So a lot of Muslims are like looking at right-leaning people and their and their methods in fighting these new norms, in, in fighting these new anti-tradition models. And they're like, we need to, we don't, we can't rely on the Quran or Hadith to fight this. So they're like looking at right-leaning people and copying their methodology and copying their arguments as a way to, as a way to resist this, the, resist modernity. And that's why you're seeing like, anti-feminism, anti-social justice warrior, you know, anti, I mean, um, red pilling. These narratives are now spreading like wildfire in, in inside Muslim community. And they're like, okay, you know, they're like, oh, the red pill community, like a lot of them are Muslim, uh, anti-Muslim bigots or what they call Islamophobic and stuff like that. So we don't like that. Uh, also, we don't like the way that a lot of them seem to be into pickup culture. Um, and and we don't like that because we define marriage into like we have like marriage and that's how we like. But other than those two things, we like everything else they're saying about, you know, anti-modernity, anti-left, anti. -left, anti um, so they're so they're getting to like if we ignore those two, those two things, there's a lot here that we could copy. And you can see also between Daniel and Raju and Muhammad Dajjal, there's also that fight. Then Haraju like is leaning in very heavy into like red pill and stuff like that. But he got a backlash. Like, why are you using red pill? We have like Islam. And Muhammad Dajjal comes like, we don't need red pill culture. This is like a very problematic community. We don't need that. Uh, we have Muhammad. If you want to fight these norms and stuff, like why don't you just look at Muhammad, right? Like you want to be like you're talking about being alpha, you know, and Muhammad Dajjal is like, you know who's the biggest alpha? Muhammad was the biggest alpha male. You don't need like these people to define what alpha male is like, oh, Muhammad like went battle in the morning and had like came had sex with like m all his wives in the afternoon. Like how, how much more alpha can you get than that? Like, so just, just use that as a model. Don't, don't use these people. But then Muhammad himself, Muhammad Hijab himself is now uh, talking to other like right adjacent people who, and who, people who are defenders, people, people who are defenders. So he accuses Daniel of leaning into that kind of community, but he, Muhammad Hijab themselves is basically trying to find with unity with defenders of tradition, defenders of tradition against modernity. Okay. Um, but it's interesting though, that because Daniel also uses uh, left-leaning language against modernity as well, right? Because it's not just right-leaning people, far right-leaning people that are anti-modernity, far left people are also anti-modernity. And then he let you uses a little bit of both, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, anyways. Um, okay. Um, Rajesh is asking, what is your general opinions on uniforms in schools? So I had to wear a uniform for the majority of my education. Um, I hated it. Uh, I think it was, at least as a as a young girl, like a means through which you get like slut shamed um, because you're like constantly badgered about how long your skirt is and how inappropriate you are. Like I just have so many memories of that. Um, so I hate that aspect of it. There's one pro uniform argument, which I am kind of inclined towards. Not like it's the only one that I kind of buy into or see the worth worthiness of, which is basically, um, that it helps prevent kids from judging each other on the basis of clothing and wardrobe. You know, like if if you can't, it it helps try to um, take away some aspects of like class barriers from students. You know, where some kids are always like flexing and showing off, like oh, I got the when I was in middle school, it was Juicy Couture, like Juicy Couture tracksuit, <laughs> like you know, like expensive clothing to show off how rich they are, that kind of thing. And kids can get bullied for that kind of for all sorts of stuff surrounding that. So in an attempt to try to lessen those types of situations, I think it's worthwhile 
that's the only one that I'm sympathetic towards. Otherwise, I freaking hate it. Just let kids be individuals. Yeah, I never considered that because I was going to be fully. I'm, I mean, I'm get. I am. I. I think like my argument was going to be that I hate it. I think that you wanting to like this is the phase in life where kids go through finding their own identity and their personality and their unique, you know, characters and trying to define who they are and what they like. So like trying to make them all confirm in this like uniform way of, you know, that's like basically and goes against that. You know what I mean? You want to, you want people to be, you want to provide as much exploration um, as possible when, when you're going through that phase in your life. Right. Um, and basically also, I think like it helps fight. I think like kids who are brought up uh, in an, from a, in, with an individualist mindset, it's hard for them to even be able to relate as an adult to any form of collectivism. They, they wouldn't even be able to comprehend what it even means, like to refer to a group of people as, you know, um, as a collective, it just would be like tribalism would be insane to them if you if you from 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 early on you treat everybody as an individual separate from other people uh but but i've never but this is something very interesting because that form of like providing people with their own individual way of being and acting um only works if everyone has the same access to experiment with that right um and and people don't, right? Like, what if somebody has only one set of clothes? And also, what what if that set that experimentation with um, individuality comes now comes with like, well, let me show you how much I'm better than all of you, <laughs> and what I can do. And also, now you're creating a different form of tribalism as the ha of, of the tribes of the people who have and the people don't, that don't, right? So you're forming a more dangerous form of tribalism if you don't if you don't so I, I don't know how you address that do you maybe how about this okay i have no idea this might be a terrible idea because i haven't thought about it for a second okay but so oh boy it, okay what if you have a school uniform not, but not a u school form you have a set of 10 and you get to choose That's basically what a uniform already is. You have standardized clothes, and then you have like no, different, in my school no, we had a formal uniform, we had an informal uniform. No, no, they're very different. Like uniform <laughs> one and uniform two, they're not even remotely the same. And uniform three, like you basically you basically limit it to the to a way so that people don't feel like they're not like bringing in too much like like. I mean, huh. you could have a policy against branded clothes or stuff like that, right? You know, expensive clothes, but that would be too much. Like, like how do you now control for that, right? Huh. I don't know. I don't know. This might be a really bad idea. But what if you have like a set? What if you have like a selection? What if you? Have, oh, what if you have a school fashion like a store, right? And there's a whole bunch of stuff, but the only thing is that whatever you wear at school should be from there. Right, so now there's a huge collection of stuff, but they just all of them are extremely cheap, uh, and people get to choose what they want to wear, and there's a variety of things to wear, and so you get to exp exp you know you get to be your own individual, but it just has to be limited based on what the school provides, and they all have the school brand on them, right? So they make sure that you don't bring anything. <laughs> Rudrash saying, Armin, you failed to understand the concept of uniform. <laughs> Okay, that's the point. I'm destroying, like, you know how I it's said I'm a gender abolitionist? It's the anti-uniform uniform. <laughs> it's the anti-uniform uniform, exactly. So you do, you're not unified, okay? So that's the point. Just like oh the God. concept of having a thousand genders abolishes gender, the concept of having many uniforms basically means that you don't have a uniform. That's the point. But yeah, no, okay, no uniform. You have a school, just like you go buy your books from a store in, in, a, in a, you know, in, a, in the school. There's a there's a store for clothes, right? And they all have the school brand on them. And it's um, all gender and... neutral. No, it could be gender, gender neutral. There's both gender neutral and gender clothes. Like whatever you want. There's like well, all... you get to work. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yes. Um 
Uh, Rogers is saying we skipped one question. Well, I mean, we're trying to like, I we think Susanna is trying to play around. We're already yeah. at two hours. Yeah, yeah. This is just cute and sweet. Manas is asking, Susanna, if I asked you out on a date this Valentine's Day, what your, would your reply be? Well, I would say oh. thank you, but I already have one. So. Oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. But I appreciate yeah. it. That's sweet. <laughs> <laughs> um, Guys, if you are, if you want to make sure your questions, like we have so many questions that we're not going to be able to answer. The only way to resolve that is for you to become a patron. Okay. That way we will have to answer your questions unless it's a, not a question. Right. So, but we'll, we'll, we'll try to get as to as many live chat questions as possible. We, we are limited. There's a lot of questions. Yes. Um, oh, black owl is just saying, I really wanted to say that I really love your beanie, Susanna. Well, thank you. Oh. I think it's adorable. <laughs> yeah. Um, what else do we have here? Um, Jack Knife is saying, how do you guys deal with grief as a non-believer? I need some advice. Well, to be honest, I haven't really had to experience or go through like, um, I mean, I've experienced grief, but not because of someone dying. I'm assuming that's what you mean. Or just so um, I don't think I'd be able to give good advice because I haven't experienced that really as through my non-believer phase of my life. Um, Armand would get better experience because you lost your mom. Yeah, I mean, when you say as a non-believer, it's almost suggesting that believers have better tools to deal with this. Uh, I think from a philosoph for, like from a philosophical perspective, they don't have better tools. Okay, from a community perspective, they might have better tools. Right, for people who are. And that's that could only be resolved with, by us being there for each other, okay? But from an individual perspective, I think a non-believer is well more equipped to deal with grief with grief than than a believer because what you have, what I think, okay, I'm not a trained psychologist, so take what I'm taking with a grain of salt. So, okay, this none of this is expert advice, right? Um, there, you know, but what I assume is true, which it could be wrong, is that you're supposed to be sad okay and you have you're supposed to express the sadness you're not supposed to like when something bad happens you're supposed to let you're supposed to let the sadness like, take over you and for you to express it you're not supposed to because if you fight it then it could crush you and it could also just stay with you for much longer, right? And I think what belief tries to do, what belief tries to do as, as what religious people claim that they have is an antidote as a way to suppress the sadness. But the sadness is not going to go away. All you're doing is not expressing it or hiding it or trying to convince yourself that the tragedy that has happened is not as bad as it is. I think... You should just, instead of when something bad happens and in reaction to it, you're being sad about it, there's nothing here to solve. You have to allow yourself be sad about it. You shouldn't be like, this is sucks, this is sad. How do I stop myself from being sad? Don't. Be sad. Something shitty happened. Forgive yourself for being sad. You're having the correct reaction. You're having the correct reaction. Just, just don't think that there's nothing here broken for you to fix. Your life, there's something, a tragedy has happened. Okay? The fix, this, your sadness is the fix. Your sadness and your grief is how you deal with a tragedy. If you re if you think the solution is to remove the grief to make yourself less sad, no, that is that is really I think that is just suppressing some your bodies and your your mental your 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 mind's way of trying to deal with what just happened. Okay, so just go through that grief, accept it, accept the sadness, be honest with yourself, and just be like, this really sucks, really sucks, and guess what? Life is not going to be always good. This is part of life. You're not going to go through life without 
a couple of tragedies. And this is you you going through this grief, you're going through this tragedy is what living is is part of living. There's no way to, you know, go around this. You're gonna have people you love, and there's gonna stuff, there's gonna be stuff that happens, and there's not, not gonna be anything more tragic than things happening to, to, to the people you love. And just make sure you express that as much as you can. Don't stop yourself from crying if you need to cry. Don't stop yourself from shouting if you need to shout. If other people are trying to make you feel better, and that might not be what you need, okay? You might, you might, you have to make it, I think if, if that's not what you need, make it clear to people that don't make me feel better. If you want to be there for me, just be and experience my grief. Just listen to me um, or hear me cry or hear me scream, accept my grief, accept me expressing my sadness without trying to convince me that this is okay because it's not fucking okay. This is like, this is the, I think one of the worst thing you could do to people when they're going through grief is trying to convince them that things are not as bad as they are. That's not what they need because it, it, it does, they just, if they, if you want to be there for them, you just have to be there for them to express their sadness upon you. And you're just a receiver and you're just showing that you're like, you're, you're, that their cries are not going, they're not just going into the void. There's a, there's somebody there that is like, go, like ex, taking this pain you know, holding some of this pain for, for, for them, a little bit of it at least, right? And and your your pain and misery is being experienced by other people who care for you, right? So that's what they that's what that's what they need. And the worst this is why I don't think the, the, the believer community are more equipped. The believer community are like the most destructive things you could do is like telling people that this is not a tragedy. And that's what the entire focus of an afterlife is, a, is supposed to be. Okay. You're trying to like make a tragedy seem like it's not a tragedy. And that's not what you need. Also, another thing that the believer community does is like, oh, may may her soul rest in peace. Like, oh, fuck off. Like, that, you know, like you're trying to make it seem like my tragedy is not a tragedy. Again, I'm not saying be rude to people. They don't. They mean well. Okay. I don't like. I hate it when people tell them, like, oh, her, her spirit is like in heaven right now. I mean, like, they, in Persian, what I heard the most is the ruhesh ruhesh. Sorry, like, like her spirit is. Sorry, I'm spinning. They're saying her spirit is happy right now. Right. In my mind, I was like, shut the fuck up, shut the fuck up. And I had like wanted to punch these people in the face, right? But in reality, I was never rude to them. Okay. So I'm not saying like if these people are saying things that you don't like, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm not suggesting be that asshole atheist that goes to people like, don't pray for me. I hate your prayers. Fuck your prayers. Like, I'm not like being this cringy rated atheist. Like, I'm not saying like, I, that was what it was going in my mind. In, real, in, in, in reality, every time they said something like that to me, I said, thank you. Okay, that's the only thing I said, right? Um, maybe maybe if you if, if you don't want to tolerate that, though, you could respectfully ask them not to say that if you think that's, if you don't, like, I'm not saying you have to tolerate it, right? but that's just what I did. Um, um, yeah, so, yeah, but, and also they mean well, okay? So they, like, even if they're giving you, telling you something that is not very helpful, at the end of the day, they're saying the thing that they think is going to help you. Okay. So even if it's not helping you, <laughs> it's not like they're well-meaning. Okay. So don't be, an, don't be an asshole to them. Right. I mean, if you end up being an asshole to them, you're going through a tragedy. So forgive yourself. You're not supposed to be the best person and act the best way at the time that you're going through a tragedy. So I'm not saying like, if you, if you do end up being an asshole to them, I'm not saying that like, you're, you're a, you're a monster or anything. Okay. So there's that as well. Um, that, okay, Robert, I am going to this this person Robert. Every time we're like trying to focus on a question that is meaningful to a lot of people, and a lot of people are very very interested about it. Um, this person comes at and like as soon as he finds a question boring or a content not that very interesting, uh, keeps saying next, next. This is boring. Oh my god, next. I will block you at some point, Robert, if I keep seeing this behavior from you. I don't need any of that from you. Other people are like, might, might be benefiting. We're sharing things. Somebody asked this question. I'm taking their question very seriously. And I wish we had more time so I could spend more time in answering the question, okay? Um, so, yeah. No, and this is the most toxic thing anyway. Saying just get over it. Everybody dies every eventually. You're an idiot, Robert. Everybody dies eventually. When you lost, you, when you lose your loved one, that hurts. 
just because everybody dies, that doesn't mean it's not going to be it's not going to be easy for everybody dies. You think that's a that's a way for you to be able to get over somebody losing somebody that you are in love with that was the source of meaning in your entire life or that was like one of the sources of meaning in your life so that's somebody that you shared your your childhood with that that raised you or that was your significant other that you had children with that you shared so many experiences with just because other people die you're supposed to get over it you can't get over it and you're an idiot you're an idiot and if you keep being so toxic, like I don't have to deal with you in the live chat, like being such a such an asshole all the time. I could, I, I, I we don't like honestly, like we don't need all the viewers. Um, we just for me and Susanna are more interested in having a very healthy community here, more, rather than having like the biggest followers possible. Okay, so if this is the attitude that you have in the live chat, I'm more than happy to get rid of you. Um, what is, oh, this is a very interesting question. Wait, these are two questions from Steven. Valentine's Day question. This is spicy. Do you think there is any, do you think there is any bit of racial preference involved with physical attraction? And if so, even if you don't favor your own race, would that be racist? So the fact of the matter is from a very early age, before we can even speak, Scientists, we can observe that infants do have a preference for people of their own race. And it's because we are attracted to what is familiar to us and what is surrounding us when we are in our infancy. And um, this just changed a little bit if you're um, surrounded by many different types of races. They actually do see a slight difference. But in general, the majority of human history has had humans that look generally like each other, just with each other. And that's who is in your environment for most of your life, right? But now in this like very globalized world, we are exposed to more people now than ever. Um, and the fact of the matter is, I think bo most people do have a racial preference, whether they're willing to admit it to themselves or not. And most people will marry or be with people who are from their race, either because of geographical proximity or they want someone from their own culture or they because they want to preserve their own culture. You see this particularly in immigrant communities or just because that's who they have a preference for. And some, I've heard somewhere that like 80% of people marry people from their own quote unquote race. I don't know how true that is but it's the majority of people. And I think this, as long as people aren't denigrating other people, I don't think that this should be seen as a super bad thing. I think that people should not keep themselves closed off to other races. I don't think, um, especially on the basis of assuming that they have certain characteristics that you look down on, like that's unacceptable to me. Um, but just being like, the, these are the types of features that I'm most attracted to. This is the group that has those phenotypes, just has the high, higher probability of having those characteristics that I'm most attracted to. So this is just my type and this is who I go for. Like, I don't think that's fetishizing people. I don't think that that's um, being racist. Like it's just having a preference for certain features or, um, and I think that's okay. I, what bothers me is like, I was dating someone and they were very attracted to me because I'm like light, I'm white. Right. And they literally said that they find like black women ugly. And that really bothered me. I thought that was unacceptable and I don't think that's okay. Like, I think it's okay to have a preference, but I don't think it's okay if it's coming at the denigration of other people. Um, what do you think, Armin? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that for, for the word um, racist to have any utility, it has to be something you have a uh, control over. <laughs> like, I don't think like, if you have any preferences for any features and like, I mean, that's your preferences. What are you going to do? <laughs> like if you want to call that racist, then all of a sudden you're going to call things that basically you don't have much of a control over 
racist and that will destroy the utility of identifying racist behavior as things that we want to change for the sake of improving society right i mean like you know so i think like if if the term racist is going to have any utility for us to uh, identify problematic behavior that we want to reduce it has to be first you know it has to be something that you, like for example if i prefer people who have a certain hair type right I, i'm not suggesting that people who don't have that hair type are inferior right it's just like a exactly. visual preference that you have yeah you, you just have like let's say you, you like straight hair or curly hair right on on on, on your on uh, that's you're sexually attracted to that right you're not you don't think like the you know if you're into curly hair you're not saying straight hair people are like inferior the problem with uh, racial preferences is that it has a history of people it, it's in line with the history like ra race as it is used as a way to categorize people in different hierarchies but if you have attractions to take certain features it's just unfortunate that that also that, that categorization has also been used by putting people in different hierarchies and making mm -hmm. some of them inferior and inferior but for you you're not as you're not doing that okay you're having the same different tastes and different features that you might have in someone's hair color or like the type of hair that they have right you're not saying that if you're not attract if you're attracted to i don't know a bronze you know, skin color over like a light, you know, a, a, you know, lighter skin color or darker skin color. You're not saying that I, those people are inferior or deserve less rights or like you, you think less of them. You're just like, you just find, you know, you're just like that skin color more. You just like it more, right? You just, it just looks more attractive to you. There's like, that's, like, that's okay. That's completely okay. Okay. If you want to label that as racist, then I'm sorry, you're gonna like it's going to take away from what we want to fight back against, you know, as you know, as uh, when it when it comes to tackling racism, right? I mean, how could it, you know? How, I, I mean, this is not just about people who are of the same race of you. A lot of people have tastes in races that are not the same race as them, right? I, I have that, right? I mean, same. I mean, take yeah. There's like, yeah. I, <laughs> In my my end, I'm uh, like, ah, oh, yes. <laughs> 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 yes, sir. All right. Um, so yeah, no, like, am, am I there are certain races that I find more attractive than others. Like, this that's true. That's that's what I that's what I feel like. Um, but there's nothing I could do about that. Like, and I'm not going to apologize for it. Like, I'm not ashamed of it. That's just how my mind was. Like, I I see, and you know, I guess, well, that looks more beautiful. What I'm going to do. Um, what are you gonna you're gonna demonize something for something that for for finding something attractive like you, i have as much control over that as my favorite color <laughs> like seriously so i don't know what you could do and it's not an it, it, first of all you have, there's two things you don't have a control over it and also it doesn't cause any harm right yeah it's not, yeah Alif is putting it perfectly preference toward ostensibly wouldn't be the same as a version from exactly but i mean even if you have even if you have sex let's say you, you, let's say you're sexually have an aversion from white people sexually okay but you still don't see them as inferior for example okay you just like you just don't want to fuck them that's fu like not wanting to fuck somebody is not if if the reason is that you just don't find it pretty if the reason is is that you you have you find this group of people inferior or or bad or something that is like okay that is racism and your sexual preferences is as a result of your racism okay that is something but if you're just like that's just not attractive to me like you know i like i like i like my men a bit darker for example okay i have an aversion to very light skin colors sexually only not like friendship not like rights not not anything else <laughs> just sexually i can't deal with that if you're like okay if you, that's okay it's okay like you can't be like my dick is like racist because it's not getting hard <laughs> like, like, like like what are you gonna do okay like i think even a version if it's just sexual like i think it's completely fine if it doesn't creep into anything else it's fine i think i think
Maybe I'm wrong. I'm open, I'm open to be corrected on that. Like, <laughs> yeah, I think that example is just difficult because in terms of like what you're saying, the aversion to, again, this is anecdotal, but what I see in the world with that kind of attitude expressed, it's always coupled with a right, denigration yeah. of that group. Yes, that was so hard to decouple them from each other. Well, so the, this, I've because... never seen it decoupled in real life, which is my only pushback. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah. I so maybe okay. So maybe if we lived in a world that racism wasn't a thing, this wouldn't have been an issue, right? But I guess you're right. Like a lot of sexual preferences that are based on race, a lot of it comes from racism. So it's really hard to identify somebody that is having is having the sexual preferences and has given the history of racism has nothing to do with that. So people are like, are you sure this is like you sound like a bit. Are you sure mm -hmm. this is not racism? Because it sounds like, like, but you you have to examine yourself. If if you have this preference, maybe okay. If you have a preference that has something to do anything with what people identify, again, race is not like a thing. Okay, this is something that people just come up with. But if it has um, anything to do with what people usually identify as race, then if you think it has nothing to do with racism, just maybe be do some self examination like other people will accuse you of things but the only pay, pay person that has and just understand that you might, you're always going to be biased so you might actually be racist and you're not aware of it right so you are more safe like if you have a preference over if you hate if you have an aversion to someone's straight hair you could be almost certain that this has nothing to do with your racism oh well maybe okay um but if it is something that usually people associate with racism then you might be racist without knowing it, and you might have to do a lot of self-reflection and deep digging, but you also might not have to anything to do with it. But it's hard to tell, okay? But also, yeah. if you have race, if you're racist, one more thing, if you're racist and you're trying not to be racist and you're racist because of these things that are ingrained within you and you're trying to do deep digging, like if you're unaware of your internalized racism, then you can, you know, Good job in trying to acknowledge that that might be a thing, but you can't also like feel too guilty about that because how can you tackle something that you're not even aware of it existing? Right? You know what I mean, like you can't be like, I have internalized racism. Well, you're not a you're not a monster. How has that been internalized? Okay, how has that been internalized? Like without you even being aware of it? Like this is not really your fault. Okay, so yeah, but go on. Rudrish is saying, Armin, the concept of race has to be eradicated, dude. We're not, like, trying to prop up the idea of race. We're just talking about... We're just using the word that people most commonly use to try to convey these ideas. Yes. This isn't something to yes. buy into. This is just for ease of communication. See? So I'm a gender abolition... Uh, 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 abolish, what is it called? Abolitionist, right? I think gender should be abolished, but I acknowledge... <laughs> No, no. I think race should be abolished. I think gender should be abolished. Okay, but I acknowledge that we could use. We it's not. We're in, we're not there yet, even remotely close to there yet. So we. I use the terms. You know, I, I don't think it should be like we shouldn't be using them because so many people use them. It is a social construct, and that's why it's helpful to use them because it is still a social construct. So just because you think something should eventually be removed. As a concept, that doesn't mean that I'm not going to use them while they're existing, right? While the people use it as a construct, right? Mm -hmm. um, this was a follow up question. And I just thought this was fun because it's close to Valentine's Day. Um, <laughs> Stephen is asking also, as a supplement to my previous question, could you both please briefly describe your ideal romantic partner? Would you like to go first or should I? Um, no, I can't, um, I think for security reasons, I will let you go first. <laughs> if you don't want to answer it, it's okay. I don't, you don't think we should? No, because it will bring attention to some things that I, we're trying to avoid. Yeah. Okay. Never mind. Um, he ba, 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 ba. Rudresh is asking, "Will you make uh videos on Periyar? 
and then he used the acronym for his full name. There are a lot of periodists here in the live chat, and it should be worth it to criticize or analyze his ideology. I would like to at some point. I just need to read a lot more about him. I've read some of his works from his Self-Respect Propaganda Institute, which was interesting. Um, and I also need to read a lot more of his criticisms. But at some point, I would love to do that. Um, this was also a very interesting question. Noyan is saying, I don't want to say it, but I'm from a lower caste, the lowest of all. And there was a study I read where it says the Dalits have considerably greater prevalence of depression and anxiety. And it is so true. I really have social anxiety. How do I deal with that? Well, first of all, um, we are not licensed psychologists. We are not mental health care providers. Okay. So, you know, don't um, follow our advice. Go talk to a professional. Um, I think talking to a professional would help. I'm someone who's been diagnosed with social anxiety. Um, it's very difficult and I can really relate. And I'm curious to what extent your social anxiety is tied to your experience of casteism. Because like you're saying, like, I don't even want to say it, but I'm from the lowest caste. Like, does your social anxiety come from maybe fears you have over people discovering your caste identity and treating you differently? Um, it's, it, or, or is this just general social anxiety, which is what I'm, which is what I'm familiar with? Um, if it is tied to your caste identity or your, your experience of casteism, I would talk to an elder um, in your community or someone who, you know, you trust who has had some life experience with these issues and just talk about getting some tools over how to face these issues in your life. That this is the kind of experience that I really can't, um, I have, I, I have, I can't speak to, um, if that is the source of your anxiety. And so, uh, talking to someone who you think is a source of wisdom over how to navigate certain social situations, um, I think will hopefully give you something that you can refer to in your times of anxiety of like, okay, how do I navigate this instead of just being paralyzed by the possibility of not knowing what to do. Um, and also, uh, if you have the ability, uh, talk to a licensed professional, because that's the only reason why I'm a marginally functioning adult today. <laughs> All right, let's go. Okay. Uh, um, D Secular is asking, hey guys, who's your favorite Hindu goddess besides Kali? Oh, I was going to say, I didn't realize it was goddess because I think my favorite Hindu Sita deity. Sita was my favorite, but she's not a goddess. My favorite Hindu, I really like Agni. I don't know why, I just really like Agni, but he's not a goddess. She's, he's not a goddess. Shiva's also um, like cool, but I just like bad boys. So, but again, not a goddess. Lakshmi. Lakshmi's okay. Okay. Yeah. I really, well, Mohini's cool. Mohini is a female avatar of Vishnu, and she was like a prostitute and very sexy. So that's cool. Hmm. Um, I just like Lakshmi because we have an art with her with the Ethereum symbol, and I just like that so much. It's so the I don't know coolest why. art ever. Yeah. Yeah. Lakshmi is like, maybe that's why I like, yeah, Lakshmi is a capitalist. That's why I like Lakshmi. That's exactly what I like her. Okay. Okay. Now I like Rudrish. Now I like her even more. Yes. Lakshmi the capitalist. I like her. Um, hmm. Who's my favorite? My favorite I, re Sita, I like Sarasvati. I really like Sarasvati. Because she plays the Veena, and the Veena is one of the most beautiful instruments I've ever heard. What's the goddess that Kelly comes from? Durga. Durgama. Durga. Durgama. No, I like her more in uh, Kali avatar than the Durgama. Yeah, me too. She has a, Durgama has a lion, right? She rides in a lion. That's pretty cool. Okay, riding in it a is. lion, that's pretty, lion, that's pretty badass. It is. Yeah. 
Okay, Dirk Amal. I mean, it's much more badass than riding on a lotus or what a or like a, a swan or something. Like, like they, they have like god they have gods and goddesses riding on swans and lotuses. I'm like, I ride a lion, bitches. So that's pretty badass. Um, Agni also rides um, a fire breathing goat. So that's pretty badass as well. Yeah, I guess like you can judge the gods and goddesses by what they ride is. So that's pretty cool too. <laughs> The old guys are better than the new ones, so that's like Hinduism. So Hinduism went downwards ever since. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like you had, like, what is wrong with Hinduism? You, you had Indra and Agni, and you like get rid of those, and you went like, it, well, they're still around, but not as much. You went with Shiva. I mean, Shiva is cool, but Shiva's huh? cool. I really like Shiva. Shiva is cool, but from the three, like from Vishnu, Shiva. Okay, she, so from the three that are the main ones, Shiva is cool. Okay. But Vishnu, Vishnu's uh, Vishnu's avatars are cooler than himself. Okay, Vishnu yeah. up every Vishnu upgraded. And Brahma is like, was, who is this he, pervert? Bro, Get him out of here. He's a pervert. He's a pervert that was married uh, his own daughter, right? Like had sex with his own. Like he he was like he got his head cut off. One of his five heads cut off by Shiva because he was a perv. Even Hindu god guys, you're worshiping gods that other gods think they're pervs. Okay, <laughs> other gods, <laughs> other Hindu gods find your gods to be too pervy. Okay, <laughs> like you're like oh Islam Muhammad had sex with a child. Yes, but Hindu gods had sex with a child that happened to be their own his own daughter. Like that's like and it, and it's not even a prophet. He's the god. Okay. Anyways, I like Parvati too, because I think all the art that's made about Shiva's and uh, uh, Parvati's uh, romance is like very cute. I I love like I love that style. Yeah, Brahma was a pervert. Sarasvati was a badass. I really like her. Is this I'm true? gonna have to think about I my favorite like though. My favorite favorite. That's tough. Okay, somebody marked this. Uh, I need to talk to I need to talk to the queer Indian atheist about whether this is true or not. Because if this is true, that would be amazing. Okay. All right. Oh, this was a so, comment earlier from Ego. I just thought this was hilarious. Sex versus gender has become the new infinity war of activist circles. <laughs> You know, I am in favor of breaking traditions as much as possible, right? So, and this is the most, the one that is being resisted the most. So if we could break this one apart, that means like modernity has been let loose. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm very much into fighting this fight. <laughs> um, yeah. Wait, there's somebody... <laughs> Like Richard's saying she, aha, she snorted. It's so cute when you I do that. I snort when I laugh all the time. <laughs> it's so cute. So cute. I can't. I forget that I do that. And other people are like, oh, my goodness. Um, it's cute. Don't stop. That's really cute. Okay. Um, I think this will be our last question tonight. Yeah. Oh, wait. No, this was just a lovely comment that I loved. Everyone's simping for Susanna, but Armin's curls are simply superior. True. <laughs> I'm so glad you grow your curls. Best decision yeah. that you've Thank made you. in several years. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you. So, no. Oh. This is a uh, big question, but we'll have to get into this. Will Biden's Ukraine versus Russia response impact China versus Taiwan? Oh, Armin, I haven't. Your analysis. Actually, I go. Well, I mean, this is going to take a while, but I haven't thought about it from that perspective. China has been showing their support for Russia. I think, like, if you see uh, China and Russia and getting closer and closer together in the unity against the West, so the lines have been drawn, the battle lines have been drawn, and people are taking their positions, and it, the lines are becoming more solid, right? So the whole, I, like, it used to be, like, this theory that China and Russia will become... A unit against you know Europe and United States, okay, and I don't think that unity is as strong as a lot of people will suggest, right? I, I'm hoping that the the Western blocs will decide to also stand strong with each other, stronger than China. Right, right now, there's too, too much 
division for my taste between European countries and North America and like Australia and Japan and South Korea. Like I want their resistance against like tyrannical rules to be a lot stronger than what it is right now, right? Like the, this is not something you could joke about, right? The world order that we all have benefited from since World War II is being messed around with. And the people who are against it are seeming to be more united, right? Than the ones that who are supposed to be defending it, right? So, and you, you can see that Russia and China are also the main supporters of all the regimes that would have, like, before had to rely on the, the world order that was created since World War II that created a, le a level of trade and peace that we all are enjoying right now. A lot of countries had to buy into that to be able to benefit from that. But now there is an alternative, right? Now China, especially China, is providing an alternative system for you to buy into. Uh, and that's why a lot of democracies push for democracies and peace is now being destabilized. Like you see, for example, in Africa, uh, coups are becoming more of a thing, like we, coup d'etats are becoming more of a thing, right? Because there was anti-coup measures by, I don't know, like IMF, World Bank, and uh, the African Union, and all these other stuff. But now you have China as an alternative, as a supporter, that having your coup history your or your anti-democratic measures is not hold up against you just like the, the uh, just like before so that's why one of the reasons other than climate change that's one of the other reasons why coups are picking up around the world again right so this this support this this alliance of tyranny of anti-democratic forces around which is mainly focused around china and russia is not part of that so Look, short term, I'm worried about Russia. Long term, I'm. I, I, it seems like the Russia is going to fail as a superpower. Like, it's whether they, whether the, the the Ukraine situation escalates or not, I can't imagine it not eventually backfiring. Like, whether uh, to for Russia, like the, the Russia is not going to be a superpower. Okay, um, but China, China, China will become a superpower. Um, the question is with ccp or without ccp okay so will ccp will be shaken off or will ccp be less powerful because china you know china has so much to offer to the world so it's hard to imagine for it i mean it's still light years away from the united states okay and i i know that's a distant measure of distance okay don't come at me okay um but it's still it's still so far away but it has a lot of potential but if that happens with the CCP, it will be tragic to the world. So, you know, I, I see more Russia-China alliance right now uh, with the West, more of Russia being like a smaller thing that China is just supporting just the same way that they support the Islamic Republic of Iran or all, all these other anti-democratic uh, systems that are around the, uh, that around the world. Like I see Russia more in line with that rather than two superpowers being united against the, the West with each other, right? So because Russia has become downgraded a lot more, right? Um, and the, the difference, so going to your question, I think that uh, given how China is so much more ahead in being a superpower compared to what Russia is, I think, you know, Russia is acting. So in, so in some sense, China's claim over Taiwan, because China is a lot more powerful, is a lot more dangerous. You could argue that it's a lot more dangerous than Russia's trying to claim Ukraine. However, Russia is more desperate. So Russia is more possible is more possible for Russia to act in ways that is not the norm in glo global relationships anymore right so in, we have imperialism and we have new imperialism right the, the for, even though new imperial imperialism is something that we are against it is so much more uh, less destructive than the traditional way of people going out and messing with borders right like that you know like the west used to do that like the british empire used to do that united states used to do that but that has died down in the last couple of decades borders are not messed around with just traditional way of sending in troops and taking over a place without and taking people's you know that is, that is it's still there if the western powers do that sometimes as well but it's not 
I mean, the Western powers don't do that actually anymore. They do neo neo imperialism, but everything else they do is within line with um, the people there. Tr tr like, uh, there's at least an attempt at giving the power to the people at that place, right? But I don't want to get into that debate. I'm just saying the more destructive way of like messing with other people's country, uh, countries is has died down significantly. And even if it happens, um, nuclear powers don't do that anymore, except Putin. Putin is reintroducing that, bringing back something that was supposed to have died down by now. China does. China is, China is a lot feels a lot more secure with its power than than Russia for it to break international norms to the extent that Putin is right. So China might act a lot more hawkish, a lot more wolf warrior diplomacy, but they might be a lot more reserved. Like they might like signal that they're sending troops, use language that might show uh, suggest that there was a be an attack, but they have, but China is too much more involved in world trade, in world diplomacy, so it has a lot more to lose from breaking that system. Like a lot of people think, like China is completely, like is Russia is like step has stepped outside of that a lot more than China. China is benefiting from the world order that the West has introduced. Like it's so much involved in that. Like it's it's trading with the entire planet. It holds the debt of a lot of countries, including the United States. China has no interest in seeing that all of that break apart. So while it might act tough, like it might like invade and do military attacks. I mean, it might some, at some point, but it's gonna, it, it cannot, it can't afford to ever be as aggressive as Putin is uh, because Putin has been on more on so much sanctions and has been so much excluded from this order like more i mean not compared to i'm not saying excluded in the same sense that like islamic republic of iran or north korea has but compared to china is like more outside of that right um so because it has a lot more to lose it's more willing to do more things but i mean if for example what would like russia be like if you move it move them even out of the swift like some people are suggesting that that would be a good, like, I was even suggesting that that might be a good tactic against Russia. But then what would they be like? What would they even behave then if they have even less to lose? So that might be an actually dangerous thing to imagine. I actually have to think about, like, at some point you want to think about, you want to include countries in this world order because that will make them more passive because they are now involved in everything else that everyone else is. But at the same time, you want to do that without rewarding bad behavior because, you know that if they're part of this whole world order, that will decline aggression, that will that would reduce aggression, that would reduce um, um, war and everything like that. But if you do that in response to aggression, then that might actually encourage more aggression because you're rewarding aggression. So it's really complicated in how you decide to do that. How do you include more countries in the system so, so that everybody's so interconnected that they have so much to lose from being for fighting against each other but how do you do that without actually doing that in response to them being aggressive because that would actually backfire so that's a very but but that's the difference that's the, uh, china is much more bigger and so much more involved in the uh, in the world order than than R russia russia is acting like a dog that is cornered so that it might bite. Oh, by the way, I'm not de dehumanizing Russians. Okay, this is a metaphor that people use when you back somebody in the corner. Okay, so this has nothing to do. Oh my God, YouTube. Okay, they just backed in the corner, so they might. I, I wasn't like forget the sim, uh, example. When you're backed in the corner, you might act uh, more aggressively, and Russia is more backed in the corner than China is. Um, and yes, um, we support Ukraine against Russia. Russia by by Russia, I mean Putin, not the Russian people. Okay, and we also support Taiwan. We're in um, we're in support of Taiwan against the CCP. Not yeah. You know, so obviously, we're supporting democracy and freedom and people's right to choose their representative. Um, unlike what's happening right now in China and Russia. And that's oh one one similarity that Ukraine and Russia ha uh, Ukraine and Taiwan have is that it's much more this fight that russia has over ukraine and china has over taiwan and hong kong is much more than just territory and borders it's also about making sure that democracy fails because ukrainians and russians have a lot in common 
they have a history. And if one of them succeeds because of democracy, it's much, it's a much bigger threat than to your borders. It's a threat to your entire model. And Taiwan also is the exact same thing. That's a very similar thing to what you have with Taiwan. It's not just about that piece of land. It's about crushing a model because you have the democratic model. If Ta when Taiwanese people live better lives than Chinese people, you're not just losing a land. You're losing your entire propaganda. So that's also about it's also also about making sure that doesn't you don't lose that battle. This is a nice comment. Noyan is saying, "Wow, I'm impressed by your topic, your knowledge on every topic, Armin." Oh, thank you. Wow. Yeah. Okay. There's my ego going through the roof right now. Thank you so much. <laughs> Major ego. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> with that. We should close out because we have been going. I think this is the longest QA we've ever done. Um, I have a okay. lot of work I need to do tonight, and I'm also hungry. You're in control of how long we are the QAs go, so we you must have been having fun if we did if we stayed here for three hours. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, okay, so if we didn't get to your question and you're disappointed by that, you can, you know, correct that by becoming a patron. And then we will make sure to answer your questions and you get priority. So you don't have to wait to the end. Um, and, uh, or, you know, you can just support us because you like what we do. You value our time and, or you like the other work that we do. Um, also, guys, we will be doing the news show in two days, so make sure to tune in. We'll be talking about juicy things like the hijab controversy in uh, Karnataka. Um, we'll be talking about the beheading that happened in Iran that's caused international shock. Um, and also some other, uh, you know, more chill topics as well. <laughs> Yes. And guys, make sure you don't leave without liking this video. Do not, yes. you have no right. You will send the Atheist Republic Army. We have our own private army and they will be showing up. Like we will checking every single, guys, please like the video. I don't know what to say. I'm using every like method in the book to be able to, this is, this really helps the channel. So like the video. Okay. Thank you. You guys are saying love the stream. So see, we did, we did a good job. So reward us with your likes. Um, and music. <laughs> <laughs> Pain. No, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. I had fun today. Thanks for nice. coming, everyone. Yeah. She, she said thank you. All right. Good show. Some people are confirming that they like. Okay. <laughs> like somebody. Okay. See, Susanna, tell, I'm telling you, threats work. I'm going to threaten people from now on. I tried oh, no. being lovely, lovely. <laughs> I was being nice to everybody, asking them to like. That doesn't work. I'm going to threaten people. Okay. From now, we're going to go with threats. Okay. Anyways, thank you, everyone, and talk to you guys in two days. Bye. Wait. Wait.